For only the sixth time in history, the 81st Giro d'Italia will make a start on foreign soil. This time it's from France, in Nice on the Côte d'Azur. Hello again, everybody. It's great to be back with you. I'm Phil Liggett, joined as always by Paul Sherwin. A quick look immediately at how the prologue time trial went, which opened this event down in Nice. It was held in rain, and the best time recorded by Alex Zula, 7 minutes and 55 seconds when he crossed the line for an average speed of just over 50 kilometres an hour. So Zula riding in the new colours for him of Festina. He's left the Anse team, starting off with a pink jersey as the first leader of the Giro d'Italia, beating Sergei Gonchar and Arturis Kasputis of Lithuania. The race this year, the shortest for three years at just under 3,900 kilometres. Well, the first stage, Phil, 159 kilometres around the Arrière-P of Nice, from Nice to Cuneo, and a very difficult stage it will be for a lot of these riders, casting my mind back to the Tour de France when it started in, nice, started in Nice. In fact, the race split up completely on the very first day, and a lot of these guys will be looking to try and get the, yellow, the pink jersey off the shoulders of Alex Zulla. And the man that won it last year, Ivan Gotti, passing to the pictures there as the race now underway. They're saying it's not as tough a route as usual at the Giro, but even so, it still has a four mountain stages, a nine flat stages and two time trials. And the weather much better today and a small breakaway getting clear here now. And we've got in this break... ...an early lead to get the pink jersey early on in the competition because the important thing about the Tour of Italy again this year, Phil, is the sting in the tail. It's very difficult going into the last four or five days with, again, that very long penultimate time trial where I think the race could very well be decided. But you see, in the early stages of all of these major tours, it's the teams of the sprinters that take control. We won't see riders like Ivan Gotti, last year's winner. He will take a back seat for at least two weeks and it'll be men like Mario Cipollini and your own Blylevens who'll be looking for the individual stage victories. And not surprising, uh, little shot there, Varysav Bobrik, but also the TVM boys trying to bring this back. These are the early days of the Giro when the sprinters will try to claim their glory. Uh, pretty routine at the moment for Alex Zula, tipped as red hot favourite, having won the Tour of Spain so well again. Now coming into his first Giro, 29 years of age, and he's joined Festina. I'm sure Richard Varenk will want him to win this Giro. It might take the pressure off Richard having to fight with Alex in the upcoming Tour de France. Just around six and a half kilometres to go, Paul, and this breakaway, which was quite a way up the road, is coming back quickly. Well, you could see the main field there being driven along by all of the teams of the sprinters trying to pull it all back together. And those three guys at the head of affairs now certainly going to be very shortly back in the fold. And it could well be that Mario Cipollini is going to look for that big win. But Cipollini, Phil, hasn't had a great season so far this year. He's been looking for the stage victories, but he hasn't been as dominant as usual. So it may well go to one of the other sprinters, like Marcel Wust, who's had a very good season so far. But his, uh, his real allegiance will be to, Mar to uh, Alex Zuller, who's the man currently leading the race overall. Well, how often do we see the peloton time their capture to perfection? I think that was the six-kilometre banner just passed underneath. So they are just under four miles from the line, the peloton. All 162 of them are together now. France is behind them as they've raced into Italy now to feel what they will feel, the real start of the Giro d'Italia. It is a very difficult opening few days because it's this high speeds that will take its toll, really. And most of these riders trying to stay very much up to the front as we go now. Inside four and a half kilometres to go, and a lot of work, Phil, is being done by the TVM squad, who certainly feel that their man, your own Blylevens, has a great chance there. But into the Rizzo Scotti team from Italy, and of course the Balan squad, who think Endeo Leone is the man who's going to take out the stage victory. He's always been a very good performer and a good sprinter at this race. Well, Paul Blyleven still looking for his first win in Italy this year. He's had three in Spain and one in Belgium. Uh, but he is a sprinter, and there's his team now giving him the best possible lead out. But there are other sprinters who will try to intrude on this. The man doing the work at the front here is Gert van Bont, 27-year-old. And he's a Belgian, in fact, but he'll try and get the Dutchman home first today. There's no major organisation there because Van Bont was all on his own at the front there, setting the tempo as we now get down to two and a half kilometres left to go. And you can see the red jersey starting to move forward now of the Seiko Cannondale Dale team of Mario Cipollini. He's looking for the stage victory. He's always won a lot of stages at the Tour of Italy now. And you can see the big red armada there of his boys trying to put him in the ideal position for this final stage. Well, the rider's not going to stay in the peloton if they get half a chance to get away here. They always carry the hopes. They never give in to the sprinters. They try to break up this big field. 
but the Seiko boys are also trying now to manoeuvre Mario Cipollini into a winning position. We're coming up to the outskirts of the town. You can see one or two riders taking a fast exit out of the back of the main field there because the speed up around 60 kilometers an hour. That's over 40 miles an hour at the moment as they negotiate these little traffic islands coming into town. And this is what is so dangerous for professional cycling these days, Phil. The constant changing of direction as you come into the town centers. Inside, two kilometers remaining and still the whole field very much together. Well, one thing's for sure now. Uh, there should be... Uh... Alex Zuller still in the pink jersey tonight because he's managed to uh, kill off the breakaway that did uh, threaten his leadership for quite a long time today. The one climb on the course did nothing to split up the field. They're all back together now. The sprinters, domestics, are going to have to get to the front and see what they can do here. Seiko boys, not really organised like they normally are, Paul, because they're not moving far enough up the peloton. And one of them's gone down. Well, one of them's gone down and somebody's gone down with him. Well, that's two riders from the Seiko team went down there. That may well be Calcaterra, one of the last men who leads out Mario Cipollini. That will cause a bit of chaos for Mario, but there's an attack going clear now. One of the riders from uh, Brescialad, it looks to me as if he's gone off the front. Well, it looks like the riding style of Piccoli, who's gone clear. Now, Piccoli has been a great climber over the years in the Giro d'Italia. He's won the King of the Mountains twice, and he's trying to get away here, and this will be a cheeky escape if it succeeds. Uh, chasing him down there is Denis Zanetta, who's now gone off to the left and has given best, I think. No, he's going to have another go. Well, that's a good move by Piccoli, a man who we're more renowned as a mountain climber because he's won the King of the Mountains twice in the Tour of Italy. But now you can see the red jersey starting to get organised on the front of that main field. That's Mario Cipollini's boys, and they're going to try and bring it all together. But Piccoli still got a lead. Oh, he's hanging on here now. He's never renowned as a sprinter, and the field are closing in on him fast. There's still plenty of time to wipe him out. Uh, just in the face of Pascal Richard, go through there, the Olympic champion now making his comeback. Piccoli, though, I don't think they're going to get him. I think the Seiko boys have not quite got into the swing of things yet. And Piccoli is going to pull off what will be a cheeky stage win here. But you've got to take your hat off to a man who's brave enough to have a go in sight of the line. And he's beaten the sprinters. He knows it now. He's watching them come. Bartoli is coming at him. So too is Greedy. But it's all too late. Inside four hours, Mariano Piccoli coming in there ahead of Michele Bartoli. So Bartoli getting close, who's now this year defending his World Cup. But the man who's in the pink, still Alex Zula, and he'll be delighted about that with a one-second advantage over Gonchar. And so we see the beautiful coastline here. Now it's the same Côte d'Azur, but we're in Italy now and prepared to run down towards Familiar Roads, Paul, uh, the roads of Milan San Remo. That little nasty climb of the Capo Berta coming just towards the end of this stage, 160 kilometres from Alba to Imperia. A very difficult climb, that Capo Berta, right at the end, about five kilometres from the finish line in Imperia. And all of these riders, we're looking now at uh, Massimiliano Podenzana, who's on the front riding for the Mercatone Unu squad of Marco Pantani. And strange to see Pantani riding so close to the front at the moment, obviously thinking that that very steep climb of the Capo Berta will suit him for a short attack towards the end. But another good finisher in their squad is Dmitry Konishev. Well, the race opened rather slowly today, but the weather is nice, and as you can see now, the race coming down to its last 12 kilometres. There is the ball head of the man who is making his name as a great climber these days, recovered completely from his bad accident, Marco Pantani. And he's clearly given out the orders today to see what he's going like, and probably to test the others as well. He's using the ripples of the hills down towards San Remo to test the peloton. Into second place there is Dmitry Konishev, so it's obviously not the stage for him this afternoon. He's thinking much more about getting things set up for his man Marco Pantani but the man who's been riding very much to the front of the main field since the very first day Phil is Michele Bartoli he's had a very difficult early season dogged by bronchitis despite the fact that he won Liege Baston Liege with great ease he's been fighting to get his form and his former trainer who's uh, left now who believes that he has a great chance of winning the Tour of Italy because he is the kind of rider who can perform consistently over three weeks well, last year's winner, Ivan Gotti, uh, not feeling so well. Um, we understand they're still having a little bit of trouble. Well, we'll find out if he can defend his title. He's staying out of the hunt today, though. Pantani isn't. Sorry about that little bit of picture breakup. That's the usual problem. 
with the trees and the atmospherics, but now Pantani making sure his team works hard here. And I think also, Paul, making sure the sprinters don't have a good finish. Well, he's going to try and rip it apart. Moving up the outside is one of the riders from Essex. In fact, that is Bettini who's coming up there. He's trying to set it up now for Michele Bartoli, and he was really coming through there very quickly indeed. They're actually on the lower slopes now of the Capo Berta, but look at that reaction there coming from Marco Pantani. He's looking for the stage victory today, and on a flat stage, that would be quite remarkable. I think every time this man makes a move on the climb, everybody puts up a big cheer because he's such a magical climber, but he's being joined by, in fact, me, Michele Bartoli. Uh, Bartoli, you know, is in with a real good shout of, of stealing the pink jersey off Alex Zuller here with the small time bonuses at the finish. He's been looking for these time bonuses. There are time bonuses out along the race route at the Intergiro. Bettini there is sat up. Now there's the counter-attack from Michele Bartoli and still putting a little bit of pressure onto Marco Pantani, but to see Pantani riding like this on the flat stages is remarkable. But this man, I think, Phil, is the revelation of the season so far. He's complained about this illness that he's had, but I wouldn't mind riding like that with bronchitis. He's always complaining about bronchitis, and he comes out and puts in some tremendous performances. He's an outstanding single-day rider. But people, see, people who know him say he really should be a great stage race rider. He's looking for an early grab at the race leader's jersey, and in fact, the Seiko boys are also bridging the gap now. And coming across the gap here is Dario Frigo for the Seiko team to try and calm things down, I think, to get Cipollini up in the action. Well, they want to try and keep the main field together in one group because the kind of rider Mario Cipollini is, if he can stay in contact with the first 30 or 40 riders, he can move up very quickly on the descent. But looking at riders like this, this, in fact, is Alex Zuller moving to the front. You realise that this has been a very tough 160-kilometre stage, and a lot of the riders coming to the front are the riders looking to take the overall lead. So Zuller, the pink jersey, tax on the back. 52 wins to his credit since he turned professional uh, back in 1991. A new team and new inspirations for him. And he's doing a lot so early in the tour because surely he doesn't expect to lead this tour from start to finish. But he's doing all the right things at the moment, letting the riders know that he is strong but when they put in the moves. Well, a great move there. You can see Zuller covering the attacks himself. A lot of the team left behind. It's very difficult because, in fact, uh, Festina this year want to be omnipresent in the Tour of Italy, the Tour de France, and the Tour of Spain, and that's a very difficult thing to do. And I feel that the team they brought here to the Tour of Italy may not well be strong enough to support Alex Zuller in a three-week event like this. Zainet tacked on the back here. Another man has ridden so well in previous tours. Didn't have such a great one last year, though. But everything under control now as they start to tip over the top of the Berta and make their run for the finish. And there's still a lot of riders left there, but I'm wondering how many are gasping now because of the speed up the climb. And a very tricky finish too. All the riders who've ridden along this road on the Côte d'Azur, the, the final of the Milan-San Remo, around about 60 kilometres to go to the finish in San Remo. But today it's around about four kilometres from the top of the Capo Berta to the finish line down here in Imperia. And the great thing about the finish is just before you get there, there's a nice fountain in the middle of the road, which normally makes the, the little cobblestones there a little bit damp and tricky. So watch out if you're riding near the front of the main field this afternoon, because that could be a dangerous spot. The race now plunging down the top end of the west coast of Italy. We're on the top end of the boots now, if you like, as we race down towards the south. Just under three kilometres from the finish. And you know the sprinters may be in a little bit of trouble here. And yesterday they were beaten, don't forget, uh, by Mariano Piccoli, who really did uh, outwhip them by thinking a little bit ahead of them. And today they could lose out again here. Well, one of the riders from Seiko trying to get off the front there. I think that was Pavel Padrinos, I think it the is. Czech rider who's on that squad there. He's decided today's not the day for Mario Cipollini, and he's trying to use the motorbikes in front of the race who cannot get away from the main field fast enough in these very tight corners, and he's got a slight advantage over the main field, but he's got a man there from, Mario, from Marco Pantani's team to cover him there, and that would mean that they will certainly about to get caught. That's Marco Velo who's with him, and he's also developing into being quite a good bike rider. It's a great name, isn't it, Marco Velo, for a professional cyclist? And uh, he's joined now at the front here. This breakaway uh, with him, uh, Gabriella Colombo is there as well, I see. So they're the three. Another former winner of Milan San Remo inside two kilometres now. And there's the champion of uh, champion of Switzerland coming across, Oscar Kamenzin. The first time we've really seen him riding well this year, trying to get across to that front group. Obviously two now, thinking about bringing it all back together. A very big group in there, and they'll be looking now, Phil, for the famous red kite, indicating just one kilometre left to go to the finish line.
all looking at each other to see uh, just what damage has been done and not too much really but they would like somebody to take up the chase and here it comes down the left hand side of the road now as the Pulte boys begin to make a launch well that's a good move there as soon as it comes together and slows down that was the the fountain in the middle of the town square that everybody has got around very safely indeed and shortly they'll see the red kite and it is a very big group indeed but i don't think the sprinters would have had much chance to pull themselves back to the front and everybody here now phil is trying to get across that's Piccoli again there in the points jersey on the front so he's going to try and make it two in a row well, I can't believe this, but you know he's mixing it right at the front again because once more it's not going to be a pure sprint finish here. There's been no setup by the big teams to get their team sprinters to the front because they haven't been able to do that today. Now there's a slight relaxation and everybody surging for the line here. And this again is a big attack and coming from Colombo once more. The times he's tried to do this in the area of San Remo, the roads he loves so well. It's not going to work this time as now the counterattacks come. Nicola Lodar is going now. And being marked, I think, by uh, Ido is on him from Kelme. Well, he's a good sprinter, and he's not come to the front at all there. And that's a moment of hesitation in the main field, and Ido is sitting right on his wheel, <laughs> forcing him to start the sprint. Loder wanted him to come through, but it's too late for that. Now he's going to come through, and Bartoli is also trying to hook up there as well. And watch out for Piccoli because he's on a high in his third wheel at the moment as Ido leads out now. Bartley's having a dash for the line as well. They're all mixing it in now. Lodar is coming and Piccoli is coming, but Ido is not going to be caught. That was a great sprint by the Kelme boy and only his second ever stage win in this event. In fact, he once won a stage also back in 1994. So, the victory for Kelmer and the complaints from the rest, but it won't mean a thing. And the man in pink will still be Alex Zula. There's the result. Piccoli got second. And Barthley wasn't far away in fourth. And Fagnini getting up there in fifth. But hanging on to his narrow lead overall is the man in pink, Alex Zula of Switzerland. And now we're looking at the stage here, which takes the riders uh, from Rapallo to Forti del Marmi, 196 kilometers. They've been very quiet kilometers. The field all coming in together, more or less, but in the last few seconds, there has been a crash involving Alex Zola. He's in the group behind and is losing time. Gonchar is in here, and as they hit the line, Minali gets the stage win. But the importance is the difference between the leaders and the second group. There's the result of the stage for the sprinters. But the new leader of the tour, Visergai Gonchar, he is now nine seconds ahead of Bartoli and 12 ahead of Piccoli. And that also includes Alex Zula. So he's down 12 seconds now. Very unlucky. But, you know, if ever there is a crash, you can always reckon that Zula won't be far away from it. Anyway, we're on to stage four now. And the riders moving 239 kilometers long the stage so far as we continue our journey down at the west coast. There's the overall situation I've just explained to you. And still only a few seconds, as is normal at this stage of the race, with Pavel Tonkov, always a man for the Giro, and the pass winner, of course, lying there poised in 10th. Probably the most dangerous man in the top 10 at the moment, apart, of course, from Alex Zuller. Well, a long stage for the riders, 240 kilometres, but the important thing is, in the last 15 kilometres, two very tough climbs, and you can see already, looking for the break early on in this Giro d'Italia as they go under the 10-kilometre banner there, once again, Marco Pantani, and again, the man here wearing number 21, Michele Bartoli. He's not very far off in the overall standings, Phil, and he really wants to get the pink jersey. What we're seeing this year, Paul, is a lot of aggression by the stars on the courses that we normally think don't really matter to the men aiming for the big result. And yet here once more, Bartoli in the frame, still looking for a real snatch at that pink jersey. He's very close and could get it, but he's got a great ally too in Marco Pantani. And the third man making up that, th that three-man leading group is Enrico Zaino, having a great tour of Italy so far. He's very often been to the front, but it's great to see men like Marco Pantani, dubbed a climber, dubbed the kind of rider who will wait for the big mountains later in the Giro, going out so early on and launching the attacks. But in fact, looking down the main road a little bit there, you can see, in fact, it's about a 15 second advantage for those three riders over the main pack. And certainly Alex Zuller must come to the front soon to try and nail back these guys because you cannot let riders like that eat away at seconds on every stage. Well, Zaina, runner up two years ago when he also won two stages of the Giro, so he's a strong man. He didn't have a good tour last year though. But Bartoli, always a useful man to have in a breakaway, and the strength of some strong teams now trying to slow down the first at the back. But once again, Alex Zuller and his Festina team are beginning to stir things up, and I'm not surprised. 
Andrei Kivilev coming to the front of the main field, but these three riders still got a big advantage. In fact, they've been through the finishing town of Monte Agrinciario, and now they're going to do another loop over this climb here, the Poggio Fondoni. A very difficult climb indeed, and once you get to the top, it's around about three kilometers plunge down to the finish line, but you can see the main field field starting to stretch out quite a bit, and another man starting to ride himself into form on the front there, the champion of Switzerland, that was Oscar Kamenzind. Well, a great season for Oscar last year, but no wins at all this year thus far. And still trying to cause a bit of trouble, though. Here's Bartoli, still mixing it near the front of the race. I think they're slowly but surely succumbing to the chase, but there's an awful lot of pressure on back in that main field. I think Bartley's going to be very surprised because over the last couple of days he's put in some pretty good attacks and each time he's gone there he's been marked by Marco Pantani, the man we would have expected to see a little later in the Tour of Italy, probably in the last week, which is very difficult indeed and these guys have seen that they haven't got the advantage they wanted so they're not going to use too much energy now because they realise the Tour of Italy is three weeks long and the big pressure on the front is coming from the Mappe squad and that's Oscar Kamenzin in, in the red jersey there with the white cross on it so it's all back together and we look like again we're going to have a big bunch sprint so three team leaders tried their luck and have been caught here in the closing kilometers of the fall stage of the Giro d'Italia and now it's Oscar Camazin for Mappe who's trying to go clear well, there's Alex Zola the former leader of the Tour of Italy looking very comfortable indeed and once again the Ballant team moving forward I wouldn't be surprised to see if again that is going to be Colombo moving forward this guy really has been looking for the win as well a man who is not regarded as a an outside contender for the overall victory but certainly a man likely to take a stage victory so Gabriela Colombo he's never really uh, performed or developed since his great win in Milan San Remo which brought him right to the head of the notice of the Tifosi here but he keeps on trying and he usually tries near the end for the opportunist escape but he's once he's over the top of this climb and that looked like Piccoli again trying to come into the action Paul what a fantastic opening few days he's had it really has been a strange tour of Italy because very often you would expect the big contenders for the overall standings to come out in the last week of the race, but this year they've been all at the front looking for the early openings, looking for the breakaways to try and grab a few seconds advantage in the first week. Well, it's nice to know now the Tour of Italy is no longer seen as a preparation race for the Tour de France. It's now a great race once more in its own right. And to prove that point, here comes another attack. And this time it's from Nicola Mikeli uh, who's going, Paul. And now they've got the stage win yesterday with Minali, and now they're trying with Mikeli. It's always good for the morale in a team to get a stage victory under your belt. There's a reaction there coming from one of the riders from Polti trying to get across. It's so important to try and get over the top of one of these climbs with a five or ten second advantage because then it plunges right the way down to the finish line. And, and that strange style there of the Polti rider looked to me very much like Luc Leblanc. Well, if these two get together, they might have a result on the stage today. Uh, Meekly hasn't won a stage, uh, hasn't won a race this year, actually. Now, remember Luc Leblanc, spectacular crash for him in last year's Giro in the time trial when he slammed into that wall and continued only for a few more days and he was forced out of the tour. He really does have a lot of bad luck, but there he is, he's come right up behind the Italian. Good move by Luc Leblanc there, looking as he gets towards the end of his career for a good performance in the Tour of Italy to go out on a high note. A former world champion with a very strange career because he's been up and down throughout his career so many times. But today he's looking for a stage victory in the, the Tour of Italy and he's come to the front and he's joined up with Michele. So here they come now, or will very shortly into our view. There they are over the top of the climb. Now just to plunge down the mountain. Well, I'll tell you something, Phil, on the descent there, Luke LeBlanc, who looked very comfortable indeed, in fact, took the mounting points, has disappeared from the lone leader, and now Nicola Minelli, Michele is on his own with about seven seconds advantage over the main field. Well, we can only presume he must have punctured because he disappeared so quickly there, but now Michele is on his own, pushing the biggest gear left on his bike. Those legs are going to be searing with pain as he tries to keep it going. It's all or nothing now as he tries for his first win of the year, and he's got just a 1,000 metres to go. That's about one minute and 10 seconds of pain for this man in the lead now, and he has to give everything he's got, go as deep as he can, push himself really over the pain barrier, because now the main field will be hammering along with the sprinters trying to get the blood for themselves because they want the stage victory, and they can sense it. His advantage is still hovering around seven seconds, but it can disappear just as quickly as that. Well, Mikli now is 100% committed here. The day's gone well so far, but a good result for Mikli Bartoli could give him the pink jersey off the shoulders of Gonchar. So the chase down, I think, will come even so. And they're right behind him. 
There can't be more than two or three seconds if our camera pulled wide. I'm sure you would see the race. He knows they're right there. But I think he's just going to get them on the line. And so this will be his first win of the season and the second in succession for Riso. So Nicola Michele, the last bend. He can see the finish. There they are. Now, if Bartoli snatches second place, he's going to be right on the heels of Sergei Gonchar. And that's Bartoli on the right, leading them out. Piccoli is in there as well. But I think Bartoli gets it. Piccoli will be third. And so Velo, I think, will get the fourth slot. Well, the win then for Mikuli. But the thing is now, there's only a one-second difference between uh, Gonchar and Bartley. There's the confirmation of the result. And sure enough, Bartley, three seconds behind, gets a time bonus. Now, Sergei Gonchar, just one second to the good. 206 kilometers now as we face up to stage number five from Orbitello and then we turn inland from the west coast after we've circumnavigated Rome and nip up to that lovely wine region of Frascati. Well, it's still a very narrow race at the top, Paul, but they're still trying. Bartoli still looking for just one second now. He just needs a good result. He certainly does, and he would love to get the pink jersey onto his shoulders. But, you know, the riders all day have been on the Via Aurelia, the, the big motorway that goes down the western coast of the peninsula of Italy. And today they're looking to try and pull it all back together. Interesting to note, Phil, that over the last 10 or 15 kilometres, there have been a lot of red jerseys at the front of the Seiko team trying to pull back these two guys, a man going through there for Mape was Misaglia. He, in fact, has been joined there by, by one of the Balan riders wearing number 37, Canzonieri. But you can see the speed of the main field. They're going to end up back in the fold. And the bad news for Gonchar is at the Intergiro at around about 80 kilometers today, a second place for Bartoli and a four second time bonus has given him the overall lead now by three seconds. So it means that Gonchar must get in the result here, and that's highly unlikely. He's a time trialer, not a sprinter. And the way the Red Guard are going, that looks to me as though this might be giving us the first stage victory of Cipollini. At least they think so. Well, I think they've been given the nod today. This is the first time we've really seen the Red Guard of Seiko Cannondale looking like a good squad here. There at the back there of that line, wearing number one, is Mario Cipollini. He's the man now who is looking to get himself. In fact, that was Van Gotti wearing number one. I'm so used to seeing Cipollini as the leader of the squad, but Gotti has number one as last year's winner. But certainly Mario Cipollini will be in there very close to the riders there, setting the pace for him at the front of this long line because he will be thinking about a great stage victory for himself. But over the last few days, he really has had a hard time. And in fact, the two leaders there still out in front by a fraction. I uh, Just a fraction, though. Canzanieri is setting the pace there, and with him is Misaglia. But I think they're going to be swept up because these boys are motoring. Now, the pink jersey is nicely positioned uh, in the front half of the peloton. You can see him down there. So he's riding a clever race, but I think he knows now he's going to hand that jersey over probably uh, to Michele Bartoli. So the Italians will be happy. But as far as the man in red is concerned, Cipollini, he just wants the stage win to tell the Italian Tifosi he really is in this race because we haven't seen him until now. There he is, 6.85 kilometres to go, and he is waiting for the lead out to start. And always these stages at the Tour of Italy, even though they're supposed to be for the sprinters, they put a little climb in towards the finish just to sort out the men from the boys. And you can see the gap starting to appear in the main field there. And there's only two riders from Seiko left on the front to try and help Mario Cipollini get to the finish line in an ideal position. And the one thing is now his ex-teammate Silvio Martinello now rides for Polti and his arrival in this race. And Martinello, who used to be a lead-out man for Cipollini, is a very dangerous sprinting rival now. And I'm sure we've got one Polti rider there pulling third place. I'm not sure if it's Martinello or not. Looks a bit small for him. Well, you can see everybody's queuing up for Mario Cipollini's light wheel there. He's up into second position, a little early to be so high up in the main field, but they're not far from the finish line. Again, Bartoli on the outside yeah. trying to get points. And something almost happened there. Somebody fell, did they, on, on side our camera? But there was a big shout from the crowd as the riders came round that bend. I think they almost collided with our camera. Anyway, they continue to the finish as we switch to our finishing camera here. I think we lost one there. As the riders now come for the line, and here he comes, Cipollini on the tops of the handlebars, making it look oh so easy. Well, I'm sorry we lost a little bit of the shots there, but I really think we lost the cameraman on that far bend. And Cipollini, well, he's never happy than when he's winning. And that is his 22nd stage win of the Giro d'Italia, and he's on course to try and snatch Eddie Merckx's record, post-war, that is, of 25. Here's the sprint again. He makes it look oh so easy. Martinello is right on his shoulder there, and Bartoli doesn't get a bonus either. 
That's the situation now. So, there he is, Mario Cipollini, calling everybody forward while he covers them in champagne, no doubt. Here comes the champers. This man, a pure entertainer. Look at those legs. He actually won that sprint, sprint with his hands on the brake levers, can you believe? The power of this man and the cameramen daring to creep back in for the photograph. But overall, uh, Micheli Bartoli will now be called on board for the pink jersey, and there he is. He leads Gonchor by three seconds, one out on the course today. Mariano Piccoli still challenges there in third place. They're the top three, and I make Marco Velo lying fourth, and Alex Zula up into fifth slot in the overall classification. So a long motorway journey this morning for the riders before they get to start the sixth stage of 158 kilometres from Madaloni down to Lago Lecerno. And a few ripples on the course today, Paul. Three mountains taking them over the 1,000 metres point. Not major mountains. The big mountains don't come until the very last week. But certainly, this is a good course for racing over because in the last 50 kilometres, the riders go twice over 1,200 metres. And that is going to make it very difficult indeed. These two guys have managed to get out off the front. But there's a lot of pressure in the main field behind. That's Scambaluri at the front there, second in the World Championships in 1996 for under 23. But behind, you can see now the main field is starting to react and a lot of gaps in there. And the other rider, Alessandro Baronti of Catina uh, Tolo. And now we've got the leader in the King of the Mountains there just coming over the top, Atini. But he's not the real leader at the moment. Uh, Piccoli is, I think he's got the jersey on low and is second in the competition, but he's got points there as he comes over the top. And now the field trying to get a little breakaway going here. Those two leaders pulled back into the fold pretty rapidly there over the top of that climb. We're looking now at the Frenchman, Frédéric Bessy, wearing number 66 from the casino team. The dominant team on the international circuit this year, and he's been joined once again by one of the riders from Balan, and that's Nicolas Loder. And the main field don't seem to worry about those two guys getting off the front and riding very close to the front. Uh, resplendent in his pink jersey is the overall leader there, Michele Bartoli. Well, he's having a great opening week of the tour. He's aimed for the pink, he's got the pink, and he's still very much feeling strong there as he rides near the front of the race. Uh, here comes Bessie, 26 years of age, and the team on a high. Very difficult last nine kilometres to the stage here. Only 158 kilometres long, but in the last nine kilometres, they climb from 600 metres to almost 1,100 metres, and that is where the difficult attacks are going to come amongst the leaders overall. And for, for the first time, we get a chance to see some of the riders from the Mape squad there coming to the front, because they too will be thinking that Pavel Tonkov has a good chance of victory in the overall standings, and the advantage of our two leaders just 40 seconds over the main field. Well, this is Tonkov's big time of the year. He's never failed to have a great Giro d'Italia. He's a regular top five finisher. And of course, he's won the race second last year after a long battle with the surprise winner, Ivan Gotti, who's riding a quiet race this year and making us think that he really has not recovered any of the form. He's been complaining of poor form all year. Now, the fugitives are being brought back slowly but surely here. Well, interesting move here by oh, number wait. 92, yes. Johnny Bugno. This uh, man really I would have expected to be doing the work and I think he's gone to the front with just a little bit too much power because he doesn't know what to do now. He's looking over his shoulder and saying, come on boys, follow us. Well, it's Nicholas uh, Axelsen who's with him from Scrinio, but you know, Bunyo riding out his final season and what a great career he's had. As Bettini brings the rest of the race up, Kamazind is there, easy to pick out in that national championship jersey. Gotti on his wheel, last year's winner, the current race leader, and Bartoli is there, Alex Zula is there, Marco Pantani is there. So quite clearly the strongmen feel that this race might explode sooner or later. Well, there's only 10 kilometres to go. 10 kilometres to go, very shortly they'll be at the bottom of that final climb and that I think is when the fireworks certainly are going to begin. A lot of work has been done by Paolo Bettini there in the green jersey and right on his wheel is the man leading the race, his own teammate, Michele Bartoli and that's where they're going to go right now. The Valiccio di Valaggio, a very tough climb to the top and once you get over the summit of the climb, it's three kilometres flat to the finish line down to the lake which we might or might not see the race finish line comes just before the lake itself which will be on the right of the riders approaching the line well Bunyo's going again in fact he's decided nobody can stay with him today he's obviously in one of those great days looking for a stage victory in what is certainly going to be his last tour of Italy this year and he's just ridden away from the main field let's not forget that there are two leaders out on the road and Bunyo is looking for himself to try and ride across to those two guys at the head of affairs 
And there are the two leaders, uh, so they're back in the fold. At least there are three of them, but, you know, Bunyo is not very far ahead. And the way the leaders are climbing now, I think they've had just about enough. Although Bessie takes a look at Bunyo, knows his reputation, and takes his wheel just to see what will happen, I think. It's great to watch uh, Gianni Bunyo ride a bike. He's such a powerful rider. He sits there on the bottom of the handlebars and just keeps powering away, but he's not got too much of an advantage over the main field because Paolo Bettini is dragging them along. They're already in the streets of the climb, halfway up the climb at the moment, and but you can see that Bunyo is putting a lot of pressure on, but I think these two guys are going to get caught pretty smartly, in fact, because the main field has got all of the big leaders in it, and it is a tough finish after 158 kilometers. Tacked onto the back there is Loda over a few cobbles here, but they're not too bad. You can probably hear the bikes bouncing over them nonetheless, as the former double champion of the world, Gianni Bunyo, and twice a winner, by the way, at Alpe d'Huez in the Tour de France, continues to set the pace. But he's not far. <laughs> That's an understatement, isn't it? He's now all together, and it's Bettini and Kamazind who bring them up. Certainly is. You can see there, Kamenzind in the champion of uh, Switzerland jersey moving very close to the front. And what Gianni Bunyo will do now is try and keep the pressure on to make sure there are no surprise attacks from anybody. But Bettini's not having any of it. He's coming straight to the front and deciding that he now is going to set the pressure because he wants to make sure that nobody launches an attack on his teammate Michele Bartoli in the pink jersey. Cameras in, riding a great race uh, for Mappe, but of course he's making the way. He hopes for Pavel Tonkov later. They're all talking about stage 17 as being the stage this year where it will all be decided. That, of course, is still to come. There is the man in pink, and of course, at the moment, he's thinking purely of hanging on for as long as possible in Italy. Uh, Bugno, you may have seen, drop straight through our picture there. His ploy didn't work, and he's decided to call it a day for the moment at least. A lot of riders from Festina moving to the front, and our dear friend the Devil has turned out again. He really is becoming a major attraction at all of the major stage races around the world, and uh, he must have a pretty decent sponsor to get all those holidays. Well, he only speaks German, and now he's moved into the land of the Italians here as Festina are on the front. Now, I wonder if Alex Zula has sent the signal forward, because Zula is moving steadily back up. Remember, he was the early leader after his victory in the prologue. He hung on after stages one, uh, lost the lead on stage two to Gonchar, who's in turn now lost that lead uh, to Bartoli down there. Now, is Zula feeling that this is it's actually quite a long climb, Paul? And there's the gradient, 21%. One, it's not so steep, but it's a hard climb, this... It's a hard climb. At this point, it's, uh, in it? fact, uh, Michele Bart has decided it's hard enough for him because he's come out of the front of the main field. Obviously, the main field's slowing down a little there, and he felt this was a time to try and launch an attack. But look at the man marking him straight away. There is Marco Pantani, the pirate. This man, certainly after that accident two years ago, Phil, I reckon he's back. Well, it's a short stretch of one in five in old parlance here, and that's just the sort of gradient where this man comes out of his shell. He's 26, but he's only 41 seconds off the Maglia Rosa. And Bueno Hora, I think it is, who's come up behind him. Another goal. No, it's Kepi Gonzalez who's come up behind him from Kelme. And just behind him is a Bartoli. No, he's not anymore. Bartoli's dropped out of it. Well, Bartoli was up there. He's the man who launched the attack initially. I'm obviously over-assuming on his possibilities. That, in fact, is Gotti who's moved up there. The pink jersey still safely in the front of the main group of what is now looking like just 10 riders. But also moving very close to the front was Alex Zuller. But look at this. Marco Pantani now putting the pressure on. He's decided, even though this is not one of the major climbs of the Tour of Italy, he's going to try them out. It's lovely to see him do it. He just relishes getting onto these climbs. He runs straight at them. It's good for Gotti here, and he needs the confidence, I think, so it's good to see him riding second wheel. <laughs> well, he's dropped back a little bit now because the pressure has gone on, and just the tempo being set by Pantani is hurting the whole field. Well, nobody, I don't think, in international cycling can climb as well as Marco Pantani. He's able to explode on the slopes of a climb much faster than anybody else, and the only thing you can do to handle him is just to let him go and try and use the climb at your own pace. There is Pavel Tonkov moving into that group of what now is a very select group of riders. On the back there, you can see Luc Leblanc, another rider moving in there as well from the Palti squad. That, I think, looks very much to me like Giuseppe Guerini, but the man really doing the damage is Marco Pantani. Well, here is Pantani. I'm not really interested where he is in the interior sprint competition, are we? But nonetheless, uh, Pantani here, now heading up to what he hopes will be a stage victory. A man who keeps on telling us this course isn't for him, but he never gives up trying. 
Well, he's the kind of rider who will use every opportunity and try and take as much advantage as he can. The reaction now coming from Michele Bartoli. But as you said earlier, Phil, this, in fact, is the shortest Tour of Italy in three years. And, in fact, there's the least amount of climbing in the last three years as well. So, certainly, I would have to agree with Pantani. The course does not suit him to perfection, but he's trying on every occasion to grapple a few seconds away from the leaders. Well, if you're Italian, you've got to put on a show, and they always expect Il Parato to be somewhere in the thick of the action. There's Luc Leblanc, never far away from the front either, very aggressive bike rider, and riding at a steady tempo. The main group there now being led by Vladimiro Belli. He wears number 71, but certainly the leader in that team must be Alex Zula. Almost getting across to Marco Pantani, Michele Bartoli in the pink jersey. Just goes to show what kind of form he's come to this year's Tour of Italy in, because to be able to match a man like Marco Pantani on the climb shows that this little Italian, who really so far has made a name for himself as a one-day rider, is riding perfectly into the, the shape of a man who's going to be great in the stage races to come. And Luc Leblanc has realized the danger and he too is trying to get across well this is the tough section approximately two and a half miles of real good climb here for these riders and Pantani's gone early on to try and open a gap now Bartoli has been joined by Luc Leblanc the former champion of France and indeed a former world champion the main field is splitting up Paul it looks like eight nine maybe ten chases here well, Belly's on the front there, right on his wheel is Alex Zuller and all the big leaders of this year's Tour of Italy at the front of the race for the first time so far. This is when the big decisions are going to be made for the first time in the Tour of Italy, and we haven't even finished a week's racing. Michele Bartoli trying to get across. You can just see the shadow of Marco Pantani going around the corner there, but the crowd, obviously, they don't know who to shout for because the two strongest men in the race so far are the Italians. Well, Bartoli needs to limit the escape of Pantani to 41 seconds, well, less actually because of the small time bonuses. The crowd here are running at the same speed as Pantani, who's concentrating desperately on the job in hand. I uh, wouldn't get too close. He's apt to swing out with that left and knock one of them out of the way. But here come the next two right behind. Look at this, the Tifosi in full cry. Well, this is madness. This is Italian madness in May. This is what the Tour of Italy is all about. The crowd get in there and they support the man who they think is the greatest. And Marco Pantani is one of those riders who really is so magnificent to see him riding on the climbs. But he's not firing on all cylinders, Phil, because certainly he hasn't opened up a major advantage over Michele Bartoli, who on a climb like this should not really be able to rival Pantani. Well, they just love him, don't they? But he's picked up the tempo a bit now, maybe to drop them. But, of course, they're coming out of the bushes now to run alongside him. Here's the race behind. Tonkov's in a little bit of trouble, Paul. He's lost ground there. Well, Tonkov was trying to stay with this group, and you can see he wasn't able to stay on the wheel of the rest of the group with him. There is Garini in, fr in front of Luc Leblanc, and they're trying to stay very close together. And look at this. In fact, Rebelin as well was in the group there, but the man doing the damage is Marco Pantani, 101 on his jersey there, and he really is opening up the gaps. 21 is Michele Bartoli. There's Luc Leblanc, and Alex Zuller now pulling himself into the race. Oh, Zuller's unbelievable the way he's crossed that gap. Despite all the atmosphere, the adrenaline must be flowing now in all of these top bike riders because the crowd are transmitting it to them and they're trying to keep their man in the front but look at Zula now responding to the occasion this man who speaks fluent Spanish and indeed fluent Dutch as he races across the gap here he's gone through them he's gone past Michele Bartoli he wants now Marco Pantani Amazing move there by Zuller, but what a reaction by Michele Bartoli. That guy's got so much courage, it's unbelievable. He saw the attack coming from Zuller. He's all over his machine now. Look how he gets down low in that position to try and find a little bit more energy to try and get onto the back wheel of Alex Zuller, who has now caught Marco Pantani, and it's all back together. Well, it should be about four hours of racing today because it's just on 100 miles, but it's been a real tough race, this one, and this is becoming quite an interesting tour. Five kilometres to go, and they should catch uh, Alex here as they start to go downhill. He's not the cleverest of descenders. Well, it's a very easy finish for Alex Zula over the top of this climb because, in fact, it's almost flat down towards the finish line. Three and a half kilometres from the top of this climb, and Pantani leapt across the gap there, but you can see the pink jersey not having an easy ride here this afternoon because he couldn't match the acceleration of Marco Pantani there, and he's looking for some help to come from Luc Leblanc to try and pull himself up to the two leaders. But look at the speed of Alex Zula, and now it looks as if Bartoli's in difficulty. 
A Bartoli dangling here and gambling because if he allows them just a few seconds, he'll lose that pink jersey. We've got Zula, Leblanc, Bartoli and Pantani there in the front. There is a chase group behind being led by David Rebelan and Vladimir Belli and Nicola Michelli and Giuseppe Guerini. We have seen something of them. Zain is there as well. Well, over the top of the climb, Alex Zula now leading. Marco Pantani wasn't able to match that next attack there and he's going over the summit eight seconds adrift with Luke Leblanc. But the, yet the pink jersey a little bit further further back 13 seconds in arrear so he really is suffering this afternoon I think he's done well to limit the attacks considering it's been Pantani turning the screw uh, it's all being well Bartley should get back and conserve that pink jersey but he's going to worry too about the whereabouts now of Alex Zula because he's a higher place rider than Pantani and Zula if he gets away could open a big enough gap to take over the race lead well, he's on the ground that suits him now. He's a great time trialist, Alex Zuller, and he's really opened up the advantage. 15 seconds I made it over the chasing group, and they've obviously slowed down because Michele Bartoli in the pink jersey has recovered just a little bit to get onto the back of Pantani and Luke LeBlanc. But look at this, Phil, the face on Alex Zuller here. He knows now that he's got to give it everything. Just about two kilometers to go to the finish line for him. They're on the plateau. There's the lake in the background, and he is now looking at taking the pink jersey off the shoulders of Michele Bartoli. Well, if the gap is 15 seconds, then we have a new pink jersey on the road, and here he is, Alex Zuller. He lost the lead on stage two. He's now trying to reclaim it on stage six. Something of a surprise, Paul. We would have expected him to have gone in the time trial again. Well, I thought he would wait for a little bit longer for the time trial. That gap is not 15 seconds because Michele Bartoli has come to the front and realises the danger. He's got his head right down on that handlebar there, trying to keep the pace up. He's getting some help from Marco Pantani. The Italians working well together. And Luke LeBlanc says, well, guys, I'm just happy to be here. It's up to you. And this is the chase group with all of the other leaders of the race. Well, this group are out of it at the moment, but they're only riding about 30 seconds behind the action and one kilometre to go now. Now, Zula just needs to bury himself. That's if he wants to claim back the pink jersey, and I'm sure he does, even at this early stage of the Giro. Well, it still is only a fraction of seconds, but into the finishing straight now, Alex Zula looking very comfortable indeed. In a short while, he'll see the banner across the line, and that's going to be a great win for him. But he gets a small time bonus, and that should be enough to give him the pink jersey as he crossed the line for a road race win in a stage race. That's a rare occurrence for Alex Zula. Pantani taking a look at Bartoli. I think Bartoli will finish it off for second place. Luc Leblanc might try to tackle him, but Pantani can expect to finish fourth. But the speed of Bartoli isn't going to give Leblanc much of a chance here. So he will get the second place bonus, but the clock is telling us the answer. He loses the pink jersey, having held it for just a day. And there's the rider who takes it away from him. Alex Zuller has bounced back for Festina. And that team will be glad they signed him now from Onse because he's come good in the tour. He's back in the Maglia Rosa. Indeed he is. And now we're on to the seventh stage, Montella to Montera, 238 kilometres. Alex Zuller now leading the race by 13 seconds over Bartoli. 50 seconds over Luc Leblanc and Pavel Tonkov now in fourth place, uh, just under a minute behind. An excellent move by Alex Zola yesterday, really a masterpiece of tactical manoeuvring there because he put himself into the right position to take the yellow, the pink jersey back without too much difficulty. But it's great to see the Australian rider Matty White this year riding for the Amore Vita team after, in fact, passing professional for the Australian Institute for Sport team, which is now defunct. And he now is being chased by Gianni Farazin, the Italian champion. Well, the race today coursing down the centre of southern Italy and the interior and Matt White enjoying his first Giro d'Italia winner this year of a stage of the Tour Tasmania which put him in good form before he left Australia in January uh, to join his new team of Amore e Vita. His teammate Peter Rogers by the way also on the team, he scratched in this event just before the start, hadn't really found his form at all. Well, Matty White there pulled back into the main field, but still another attack coming from Gianni Farazin for riding for Mape. He wants to get out there and try and get the team some publicity because they haven't been uh, too omnipresent so far. The team that has been very dominant in the one-day classics, certainly looking for some victories here at the Tour of Italy. But as we get closer towards the finish, a lot of riders out there sprinting, looking for some kind of glory. Well, the build of the Mercatoni Uno rider, I was about to say, is Pantani, but the speed is just a little bit too quick for him as he shot off the front under the last kilometre to go banner. And the Mercatoni Uno team on the attack. And again, and not the coordination of the sprinters. This has not been a very exciting stage at all. Most of the field are here in the big bunch sprint. 
where the King of the Mountains has been disputed between Bettini, but it's back on the shoulders again of Piccoli, who won the final climb of the day. Well, moving up there, you can see uh, looking again for the uh, bonuses, Michele Bartoli, and it looks as if the rider from, Pan, uh, from Pantani's team here has got the advantage, but they're all coming back together in third place. There in the Ciclamina jersey as leader of the points competition, Michele Bartoli. So Bartoli will try and snatch the bonus here, but he's going to have a job on his hands. Remember the pink jersey now is Zulla. He won't contest this sprint now. But watch out for the big man Cipollini. He's right there in centre picture and again sprinting so quickly. Once he sees the line, there's nobody going to get on his shoulder. Baldato was the rider in second and the Kelme rider must have been Angle Edo. And I think Glenn Magnusson of Sweden was there as well. Well, that is win number 23 for Mario Cipollini in pursuit of the record of Eddie Merckx at 25. And Baldato, his teeth on the left, just could not get alongside him at all. So, overall, Zuller is now in the pink, 11 seconds ahead of Micheli Bartoli. And third place, 50 seconds back, is Luc Leblanc. Pavel Tonkov, 56 seconds back. The fifth place rider is Paolo Salvadelli, a teammate of... Cipollini 57 seconds down on to the eighth stage now heading down towards the most southern point of the course Paul weather always guaranteed and as usual it's hot it certainly is over 35 degrees Celsius this afternoon and these riders taking a very early roll away from the town of Matera but the southernmost tip of the race Lecce is something the riders will be looking forward to because from here onwards they'll be heading north towards the mountains and we're in the hot area now of Italy. We're right down the southernmost part of the course, heading down to Lecce, 191 kilometres. There's the overall. Still seconds. Uh, Pantani up, though, into sixth place and only a minute off the pace. And also there, Gotti, still in the frame, the defending champion. And the race today hasn't seen too many attacks, Paul, but I guess we would have expected that. And now look at this, Cipollini back on board. And this is an on-board camera, by the way, on one of Cipollini's teammates' bikes. Well, this is what it looks like when you're leading out Mario Cipollini. What a great formation the Psycho Cannondale team is. A big, long line there, every rider setting the pace, but they're being challenged there very much on the left-hand side by Polti and obviously by Silvio Martinello, the man who used to be Cipollini's own lead-out man. And this is the chaos in the main field. Well, remember, Cipollini's tail is up now. He's had two stage wins so far, and he's only too short of the record. And Martinello would like to break it all up for him, but they're all coming up to the line together now. And, in fact, the Andrea Leone's team's also having a go to get them to the front as well. So the sprinters, this could be the first real sprint of the day here because Bartoli has been swept away from the action because the big boys are firing now and the big boy is coming through again. Mario Cipollini has no equal on the line and Martinello second again. Leone got third. What a result. And that means now that Mario Cipollini has enjoyed win number 24. And in fact, that camera was on the bike of the man himself. Well, a great risk to take, but there he's got the jersey on his shoulders of Inter Milan. And I have to tell you one thing, Phil, this man really loves to play for the crowd. And that jersey on his shoulders is going to cost him a few more Swiss francs, but for Mario Cipollini, that's not a problem. Does he care? He's a great football supporter as well, and he's an extrovert. He's having his own private battle on board there now. Now they've made way for Alex Zuller, still the leader of the tour and still the man to beat. The riders now facing up to stage number nine as we stay down in the south of Italy from Foggia to Vasto. Beginning uh, to turn north a little bit now. The riders having come north on the east coast uh, by road transport up the motorways. And now heading up on what is expected to be a fairly regular stage here and that's the way it's proving so far. Well, the course today, just one small hill along the route, came early on and, not surprisingly, won't cause too much trouble. This is the overall situation. Bartoli looking for five seconds to get his pink jersey back. Luc Leblanc for 50. Now, just watch the top of the picture here because a little bit of argy-bargy going on there with the Amora Evita rider, and I think that's Glenn Magnusson who wants a little bit more space from the Seiko riders. We run down to the final kilometre. There really hasn't been much action all day. The sprinters should be back in control. Well, the team at the front now is the Balan squad in the white jerseys. They're trying to get it all together for Andrea Leone. He's a great sprinter, but you can see the speed very high indeed. Just pulling off there, the leader of the Intergiro in the light blue jersey. He's sat up. He's had enough 
of the action at the front here, but definitely in control of this flying main field. But Phil, there's lots of argy bargy going on there. Everybody fighting to stay in position, and in fourth position there in the red jersey on the right hand side is the big sprinter Glenn Magnuson. And the one man not in the picture, not really, is the big sprinter who's winning so well, Cipollini. So this could be a different result here because the sprinter's now opened up for the line. As uh, Silvio Martinello is right there, he's had two seconds so far. As they come towards the line now, this is going to be a real battle here. Martinello trying to get on terms, a winner stage. Magnussen is there and trying to get through, and I think he's got through. Glenn Magnussen, who always gets a win in the Giro, he's had one last year, one the year before, and he comes up smoothly on the right here. Martinello bursts through as well. Well, that man's now had three second places in as many days, and he won't be too pleased about that. Glenn Magnussen for Amore e Vita gets the stage win. It'll mean nothing to the overall classification, but nonetheless, for Amore e Vita, one of the smaller teams in the race, it will certainly mean a lot to them. And there's the result, Cipollini getting up for third. Well, this 10th stage of 212 kilometres from Vasto to Mastodata. I tell you what, Paul, you have difficulty getting lost on this route because we run right along the coastline all the way. Well, as long as you keep the sea on the right-hand side, nobody's going to get lost. As long as you don't miss the left-hand turn at the top end of the course. And Mario Cipollini's guys, again, very much to the front on a stage like this. They have to keep control if they want Mario Cipollini to keep the victories. But as they turn inland off the coast, it really does climb up towards the finish line. Mariano Piccoli trying to get away again here now. He's no longer the leader in the King of the Mountains. Uh, Bettini is, and so he's back in his team colours and still trying to get away. And Cipollini's team doing a lot of chasing down here because time beginning to run out now as we head up towards the mountains for Cipollini to get that 25th stage when he's looking for. It's been a very tranquil day today, hardly any attacks at all. And now we're inside three kilometres to go and Cipollini's race is about to start, I think. It certainly should be these flat stages are what Cipollini has to dream about because in a couple of days' time the roles will change as he goes under the one kilometre banner because now, Phil, certainly the mountains are looming on the horizon and again, Polti very aggressive in these closing stages. Three second places so far for Martinello. Surely, sooner or later, he's going to snatch the stage win, this brilliant all-rounder, because he's also a track world champion. Don't forget, Martinello has got the wheel of his former teammate, Cipollini. They're in second and third place here as they try to sort it out as they head up towards the finish. Cipollini looked to me as though he was feeling the pressure there because he's only got one rider left in front. And that was the uh, blue jersey on the shoulders of the Inter-Giro leader, but Mario Cipollini's got it this time and he's being challenged all the way up to the finish line by Martinello, but nobody can challenge Mario Cipollini here in the sprints field because he is the king of the sprints. 25 wins at the Giro d'Italia. So he matches the great Eddie Merckx, but he's a long way to go to match Alfredo Binder, who has won 42. So the riders are now facing up to a little visit to San Marino as they start now 220 kilometers of the 11th stage. The race now well into its uh, second week. And the man in pink, still Alex Zula, by just those few seconds and still anybody's race, of course. And a rider on the move here at the front is Denis Denetta. Very aggressive rider. Everybody wants to try and win here in San Marino, especially the Mercatone Uno squad, because they are based here. This is where the team has its headquarters, and so certainly we'll have to look for Marco Pantani going for the win this afternoon. Going down the outside, though, is Kepi Gonzalez, but still Zanetti managing to hold on. Well, this is a breakaway that's got itself going. There's nobody of note missed it so far. It's about three and a half minutes up at the moment as Kepi Gonzalez tries to show us his climbing legs and move clear of the field. And Gonzalez here looks, Paul, as though he's being joined by Andre Noah, who in all of his career has never won a bike race, as a pro anyway. Certainly be looking to try and get one here, but still Zanetti at the front, a very aggressive rider managing to hold on, but he can't hold on the onslaught of the arrival of Kepi Gonzalez, a very good climber, a man who in the past has won the King of the Mountains here at the Tour of Italy, and he's looking to give Kelme their second stage victory in this year's Giro. And do you remember when he won a flat stage of the Tour de France that shocked everybody, including Kepi? <laughs> Certainly did. He was sat on for the back on the back of uh, Ugramov for a long time there, and Ugramov, I don't think, was very happy about that victory. Kepi Gonzalez certainly was, and so was half of Colombia. Now, the man moving up here is Andrea Noe, trying to make sure that he too can pull up the Azix team into contention. There, Gonzalez in the light green at the front, followed by Zanetti, and Andrea Noe moving himself up to give a three-man leading group. 
Well, incidentally, it's uh, Michele Bartoli's 28th birthday today, and so they would like very much to get him into the pink jersey, as cyclists always do, like to celebrate in style. So Noah's been told to get up there and join the breakaway. Gonzalez, though, virtually uncontrollable on these slopes as he continues to press on very difficult place to finish a bike race most of these Italians certainly know the roads they're riding on at the moment because at the end of the season there is a very well-known bike race called the Coppa Placci which is held on these very same roads now five kilometers to go Andrea Noe decided to have a little attack there but Kepi Gonzalez wasn't having any of it Okay, Mikel may have got one stage win so far. They're a wonderful little team. They always pop up with the goods. They had a great tour uh, Giro d'Italia last year, and now they're trying to lay the foundations of having another good one this year with their favourite playground, of course, the Dolomites, still to come. Five kilometres to go, and this is the main pink jersey peloton with Zulla right there. One minute and seven seconds, their advantage over the main field. And now you can see the Mappe squad certainly putting an awful lot into trying to keep the main field, the main group there, or what's left of it, in with a chance of victory. That was Missaglia on the front there. And Gonzalez putting the pressure on Noah here, trying to get away and give Kelme that second stage victory in this year's Giro. And let's not forget that Kelme has been in the sport for an awful long time. It's the longest sponsor that's been involved with cycle racing. Well, Noe surprising and continuing to surprise here as he hangs on to the back wheel. And in fact, his teammate advising him of the location of the peloton behind, which contains uh, Bartoli. There's a little bit of a slow motion here as Kepi Gonzalez tries to go through on the inside. He may, he actually forecast the attack there, and Noe, I think, was too quick. He spotted it. Well, in professional bi and that's known as telephoning your attack, <laughs> and that's definitely, he did the STD dialing code and everything there, as well as using probably his calling card, because Noe wasn't going to let that one surprise him. Marco Velo second in line, Connie Sheva at the front here, as they continue to set the pace in the hope that they can do something for Pantani. Pantani doesn't live very far away from the finish today, so I'm sure he won't stay in the bunch all the way up to the line. More reinforcements coming up and the arrival here of Ser Pellini, former junior world champion. And he rides for Basilila. Amazingly, Basilila, sorry. amazingly enough, just 25 years of age. It seems like he's been around forever. He was one of the youngest riders in the Tour de France a few years ago, taking part at just 21 years of age. And in fact, he's gone straight yeah. past there. And no, he's not happy at all with the performance here of Kepi Gonzalez. No, Gonzalez was happy to climb alone, but didn't really want Noe around. Noe wasn't going to do much, so he's decided to stop working. And look at this. There's more boys coming up now from the back. Looks like the tall figure of Zanet who's come through. Well, I think he's recovered, actually. He was dropped earlier on because of all that attacking between Noe and and Gonzalez, but in the main field behind, now it's the Mercatone Uno boys. The local team here have put the pressure on. They reckon that with the gap hovering at 30 seconds, they can pull Marco Pantani back into the fold. But look at this. You can see, in fact, the pressure really started to tell here on Serpolini. This is a very difficult climb indeed. And in fact, Kepi Gonzalez has gone away in front, still with Andrea Noe. But the pressure, and look at Phil, at the pedaling style of these riders. It is so steep on this part of the course. Well, Bettini, the current leader in the King of the Mountains, but let's not forget he's a teammate of Marco Pantani. Pantani is wanting to do something about this now. He's waiting for the slopes to steepen and start to go for the leaders. You can see in our bottom picture there, Gonzalez, and right in the distance is the group on our main screen here, and Bettini's riding very, very well. Now, Zulla must keep a close eye on the whereabouts of Pantani here. He certainly must. In fact, Kepi Gonzalez has got rid of the man who was with him, Andrea Noe. There, in fact, wearing number 44, Serpolini. He's been caught by the main field, so the advantage now must be well inside the 20 seconds. And Marco Pantani coming to the front, putting pressure on the pink jersey of Alex Zulla, who still is very close to the front of the group. And in third position there in the Ciclamina jersey of leader on points is Michele Bartoli, a former leader of the race. Well, Zulla is not only going to sit on the wheel of Pantani, but he's going to give him a helping hand as well here, as he realises he could split the field here and maybe shed Bartoli on this long climb up to the finish. There's a slight respite just before the summit, and it climbs on towards the end. Well, there's the devil in the bottom left-hand corner there, encouraging Kepi Gonzalez onto what he hopes will be the second victory for Kelme. About seven seconds behind him is Andrea Noe, and in the main field, that attack by Marco Pantani has not got rid of any of the major favourites, and Michele Bartoli is still very much to the front of this group, riding in between Pantani and Alex Zulla there, and very much to the front on the right-hand side there, Ivan Gotti, last year's winner of the Tour of Italy. But another attack by Marco Pantani, trying to take victory to the home team, Mercatoni Uno. And 
and the ball head of Pantani continues his rhythm. Every senses it's slowing down. He puts in another vicious acceleration. And Bettini is really going to have to grit his teeth now to hang on to Marco and give him a hand later. The steady rhythm in the bottom of our screen of Kepi Gonzalez, who had such a great Giro d'Italia last year, and now is trying to steal this stage. He really must keep the pressure on because the main field really has put the hammer down in the last few kilometres, Phil. The speed is very high indeed. This on the front now is, in fact, Paolo Bettini. He's putting the pressure on, hoping that if they can bring all of these riders who are up the road in front of them together, then that will give Michele Bartoli a chance to get the stage victory on his birthday. 28 years of age today, but they do have a teammate in front, Andrea Noe. He's trying to stay in contact with Kepi Gonzalez, who for the moment is the lone leader, but Pantani's gone again. Pantani, there's no holding him today, Phil. He wants to get the victory for Mercatoni. He knows that all of the sponsors will be at the top of the climb here in the town. And behind him, Luc Leblanc is covering the attacks of the little Italian climber, El Pirato. Well, there's nobody really got the legs to help the Pirates at all here, but look how that bunch has thinned out now as the riders try to hang on. Zola responding well, Luc Leblanc very much in the frame. Bartoli is still here, Gonzalez not climbing so smoothly here because they're not giving him a real chance to settle down. He's having to keep the pressure full on and it, it looks as though Zula is feeling very, very strong here as now they, the counter-attacks are coming from strange quarters here because that rider breaking away is Laurent Roux. Frenchman Laurent Roux on the TVM squad has gone out of the front of that group. And look at this, Andrea Noe, in fact, has recovered and he's pulled back Kepi Gonzalez. It'll be interesting to see what his tactic is now because he's not been too happy with Gonzalez and it was to go straight by and not very far behind them. Laurent Roux has almost made contact and Andrea Noe has got rid of Kepi Gonzalez, the Colombian, by about two seconds. So last year's King of the Mountains has found a mountain has hurt him a little bit too much this time. He's fallen behind. Noah could be a big surprise here. And remember, he's a teammate of Bartoli who's having his birthday today. So if Bartoli can't win, then it would be nice if somebody on the squad did. And it looks like he's going to, but the main field, Phil, is right behind there. Luke LeBlanc just coming around that corner. They've pulled the other Colombian back into the fold. And Marco Pantani has launched yet another attack, trying to pull back Noah in the last few metres. Well, Andrea Noe is going to get his first ever victory. I think he's been a pro for six years, and this is going to be a sweet one in the Giro d'Italia for him. The speed of Pantani is not quite going to get him, but look at Pantani is going to get second place, and that will be a superb result for him on the stage today, living not far away from here as he does, while the main field, what's left in the main breakaway, really, there's some eight or nine riders here contesting it as Noe crosses the line after five hours, 12 minutes. Victory for him. The clock continues to count, and approximately six or seven seconds back, Partini, uh, Pantani, Tonkov comes in, shoulder to shoulder with David Rebelan, and he gets the fourth place, and Bartoli also comes in too, so he's on the leaderboard as well, and he'd be quite pleased with that on his 28th birthday. But the look how this field is split up, and there's a few seconds opened up between them. Pantani now is going to close in a little bit on the overall classification, but Alex Zuller will be safe. He crossed the line, I guess, in seventh place today. And no real big names missing out on the move, which came on that climb at the end. They all hung on. They all got spread across a few seconds, mind you. But Bartoli should still be five seconds behind Zulla overall. There is Paolo Bettini, still the leader of the King of the Mountains. I'm pretty happy about that. And there's the overall situation. Well, the weather not so good at all today as the riders now facing up to stage 12, 202 kilometres. We leave San Marino and head to Carpi. And really, this is a very flat course indeed. And it's, it's all downhill away from San Remo. And then we hit sea level and that's the way it stays all the way to the finish. And so I don't expect the overall to change too much, Paul, on this one. The only exciting thing on the race route is, in fact, the riders going through Imola, where they used to have the Formula One uh, racing circuit there. And you can see a lot of these riders now very concentrated on the start line as they pull away from San Remo because they realise very shortly they will be heading up into the mountains. And for a lot of men, that will be the first time to try and lay down the foundations for the overall victory. But still, as always in the race, you know, whenever has been a, a certain amount of difficulty, it's been the Festina squad of Alex Zuller coming to the front to try and control the affairs. Well, the Festina team trying to stay in touch, but the reason they're trying to stay in touch is because they've got Laurent Roux in this breakaway, and if it gets too far, there could, in fact, be a switch around. At the moment, Roux is going to come home as the new leader of the Tour, and that certainly wasn't planned today. 
Well, the advantage at the moment is going up to 1 minute and 26 seconds, so it is climbing quite rapidly, and I'm surprised to see that this is the first sign we've seen of any weakness in the Festina squad with Marcel Wust, the German rider of Festina, on the front there. Well, the breakaway started at 120 kilometres and 30 riders got clear. The weather probably has helped the situation a little bit. And Laurent Roux is getting the victory for TVM, and that's his first victory of the year. A former winner of the Tour de l'Avenir. And I think the time gas will confirm him as the new leader of the Giro d'Italia. And that is a big surprise. So Zula lost it to Gonchar. Now he's losing it to Laurent Roux. So the pink jersey is off his shoulders now. That's been a rough day for Alex Zula in the bad weather. 42 seconds has gone by. And Zula is not going to keep on to the lead of the whole of that leader's yellow jersey. And Laurent Rue has sprung a surprise. He's won the Tour de l'Avenir in the past. There in the main comfort of the peloton. That's not really the word, is it? Over two, and tw two minutes, 20 seconds back. And there he is, is Alex Zula. So he loses the Maglia Rosa, and here's the man who's now claimed it. He's a Frenchman, races on a Dutch team. It's pretty unusual, that. And Laurent Roux, a winner of the Tour de l'Avenir, gets his first win of the year, and he gets a pink jersey as a reward. And that was something of a surprise, just after I told you nothing would happen on the stage. Quite clearly, it did, and the race has a new leader now. The 13th day of the 13th stage of the Giro d'Italia, Carpi Ticcio, and there is the overall situation. Another man on top now, Laurent Rue, following in the wheel tracks of Zula, Gonchar, and Bartoli, and of course Zula again. This time he's lost it to Rue Paul. Well, uh, this is Mario Cipollini not looking very comfortable in these conditions. Nobody too happy about the fact that uh, after a very hot southern part of Italy, we're now climbing up to the north of the country, and the cold rain and weather really has changed, and making this race very difficult after 13 days of racing. 15 kilometres left to go to the finish line. And all day the course hasn't been much more than 60 feet above sea level, but that's all about to change. We're going to climb up to something like uh, 1,900 feet as we get a little climb uh, just before the finish. So although we're not far from the end of the stage, there's a large obstacle which I think will ensure that Mario Cipollini won't win today. Frédéric Bessy from the French casino team has just been caught there after an attack by him. And always on these small climbs towards the finish field, we see a lot of riders from the Mercatone Uno squad coming to the front, making sure that Marco Pantani is always in the front 15 or 20 riders. He doesn't want to lose any valuable seconds on these little splits that can happen on these short climbs towards the finish lines. And you never know, he showed us yesterday, he can nip away and grab second place, he might just get the win, but it's not really his finish because there is a long uh, descent down to the finishing line, but it depends how many riders are left by the top. At the moment, the main field, all starting the climb, the rain, as you can see, is coming down. Dangerous conditions and always very treacherous. Well, this is Marco Pantani yeah. once again coming to the front on these shorter climbs towards the end of the stages, obviously trying to steal a few seconds over riders like Michele Bartoli and Pavel Tonkov, who's just moving into the frame there in the white jersey from the Mapei squad because he is the man who's really not been to the front so much in the Tour of Italy so far, thinking, I feel, Phil, about the final week of mountains and, of course, that penultimate day's time trial. Yes, and Ivan Gotti is still seemingly in a lot of trouble in the tour and not enjoying it at all, and we don't see him at all in the action either. Pantani then joined by Oskar Kamazin of Switzerland, the national champion, and uh, Pavel Tonkov, a former champion of Russia, right on his back wheel, and a brilliant performer every time he takes part in the Giro d'Italia. Well, two riders there from the Mapei squad. They might not have the same jersey on because Kamenzin is the champion of Switzerland. Riding alongside Tonkov there. In fact, he sat up. He had a quick word with Tonkov, and I think he is suffering a little bit, so he's going to sit up and wait for the main field, making a, re a remarkable recovery after that difficult day in the rain yesterday. Alex Zuller there, wearing number 78 from Festina. He's seen the da danger of an attack once again by Marco Pantani, and he's trying to ride across to this very dangerous move by El Pirato because we've seen him riding so well so far Phil and you cannot let him take a few seconds on stages like this and the pink jersey not to be seen it hasn't been a good day at all for Laurent Roux he's been under pressure and out of the front of the action today so I don't think we're going to see anything of him he's reported to be quite a way behind as this race continues at a very good pace here and two of the top names of the Giro now tapping out the rhythm Pavel Tonkov staying on the back wheel of Marco Pantani. Alex Zuller still struggling, but getting across that gap, albeit painfully. 
once again in the Tour of Italy. The organizers putting a very well-placed strategic uh, climb in the way. Just nine kilometers from the site of this climb all the way to the finish. And if a group like this, Marco Pantani, Tonkov and Zula can get together with a 30-second advantage, then certainly they will have a great chance of once again stealing the show away from the sprinters because the sprinters have a hard time digesting a little climb like this. Zula has done the business. He's got up to Pantani and Tonkov and also another rider trying to get onto the back there but now currently three leaders at the head of the race and the crowds as thick as ever despite the cold and wet conditions here at 10 kilometers from the summit now or from the finishing line rather not the summit as the riders now start to reform at the front over the top of the Paso de los Sovo. In fact, it looked very much as if Michele Bartoli was in a chasing group there. Behind this leading group of three riders, Tonkov backing off a little bit, allowing Pantani to set the pace on the descent. And it always amazes me, Pantani is a magnificent climber, and he certainly has no fear at all on the descent, despite the fact, in fact, he's gone down. That was why he didn't have any fear. He went too quickly, and joining him in the gutter, there's Alex Zuller. Well, Zuller always goes where the rest fall down, and he went in sympathy to Pantani. Pantani lost to complete traction there. Zula thought, oh no, and decided to bail out on the left of the picture. But there was no danger. He's got his foot off. He's locked his wheel up to avoid hitting Pantani. And uh, I think he's almost gone down in sympathy there. But they're both OK. That's the important thing. And that is why you could see that Pavel Tonkov was backing off that group of riders just a little bit there because he wanted the ability to change his line if need be. Now, Pantani is up there in the yellow, but Zula has really lost it on this descent and he's gone off the road again. He's not the best bike handler. I think his nerves has gone there as well now, but he's going to get back on the course. Uh, Pantani pressing on. This is, these are treacherous, these roads right now. You can see all of the riders are quite cautious, and I don't blame them because it's not just yourself making a mistake, it's what the others do as well. Well, there's Tonkov leading the race at the moment, precariously not getting his way around that corner. In fact, there was a car stopped there to watch the racers come by, and in fact, Tonkov had to go around the back of the, ra the race car there. And the reason the roads are so slippy, Phil, is because in this area of Italy, it has been very, very dry for the last week or so, and this rain that's come down has made the descent treacherous. Well, Tonkov trying to get some advantage out of the fact that the two guys around him fell uh, but he's having quite clearly difficulties himself here as they go down there's Bettini now also trying to uh, get back up to the action and here's Bartoli too so it's all changing at the front as they make progress on the descent well, it's amazing. These guys are men who are looking at winning the, the oh. Tour of Italy. And you can see everybody is taking risks on this descent. They realize the victory is at the bottom of this hill. And in fact, Bettini has come up to Tonkov there. And Tonkov, I think, worried himself a little bit because he's missed two corners consecutively. So he's not going to take any more risks. And now Bettini in the green jersey there as leader of the King of the Mountains has taken off and decided it's his turn to try his hand at risking uh, a, a crash. Well, Tonkov, I think, has lost his nerve because he's making no attempt now to keep up with the riders who are slipping by him. As Paul said, he's, he's been in trouble twice. That is now, they are the three leaders on the road. Ghirini is the other rider who's just come up. Um, but the, the, really, the, it looks as though the roads are drying out a little bit. They might get back into the action here. They might do, and in fact, I think the caption was wrong there because Tonkov certainly wasn't in the no. leading group of three riders anymore. He just sat up and decided not ah, to take any risks. Ball. And now it's Bartoli, Bettini and Noe, three riders from the same team. So that really is quite a remarkable performance by the ASIC squad. And they're under the one kilometre to go banner here now, and there could be a change, well, there will be a change of leader because Laurent Roux has lost a big time today. He's not even up with the action at all. He's had a forgettable day in the first day in pink, and it's quite likely that Andrea Noe is going to become the new leader of the tour. So again, the Giro throws it around because Zula, having fallen on the descent with Pantani, lost any chance of snatching back the race lead at the first opportunity. As they come up towards the line, Mike Michele Bob is going to get the stage win for Azix. There's no doubt about that. Ghirini is on his wheel. The fourth man over the line is Noe. And that should be enough to give him the pink jersey in the Giro d'Italia. So, first of all, he gets his first ever win of his career. Now he's got his first pink jersey. The chase is led in there by David Rebelin. And in that group was Michele and not uh, Zula, by the way. Uh, Pantani was tagged in on the back. Zula is now safely in in this group. Uh, they're well spread up today. So there's the situation. Bartoli, Guarini, Bettini and Noe is the order over the line. And there is the respectable man. He's now the new leader.
Well, we're now just 24 hours away from the first time trial. This is stage 14, and we're also going to get a real taste today of the mountains, Paul, as we climb up to the finishing line, which is at a Pian Cavello. It certainly is a very difficult finish for the stage, but the first part of the stage very flat indeed, and all of the riders in the main field realising that this is the major rendezvous for the climbers of this year's Tour of Italy, and the crowds, Phil, are always magnificent in this part of the world, and Ferrigato, well, they're all out cheering for him. Yes, it must be absolutely wonderful to be a famous racing cyclist in Italy. Of course, it's not so good if you're off form, like Ivan Gotti clearly is. It'll be a big test for Ivan today as last year's winner of the Tour because it's a long, long slog to the top of the mountain. It's a 15-kilometre climb at the end of this stage, which is 165 kilometres in all, and it climbs up to 1,270 metres. So certainly all of the big guns will have to show this afternoon. And it is difficult to have a mountain top tip finish the day before a very important time trial as well. So it'll be interesting to see just how good Marco Pantani is, Phil, because on the short uh, climb so far, he showed himself to be almost impossible to follow. And today is a race for him. But early on in the race, we had a breakaway of six riders going out in front, trying to steal the show and the sting out of the climbers. Just one Spanish rider and all of the rest are Italian. And now it's a matter of chasing them down. Michele Bartoli passing through. There is the pink jersey for the first time in his career of Andrea Noe. And uh, he knows that Bartoli will do all he can to help him keep that pink jersey today. The showdown undoubtedly is going to come on the climb. It's long enough for the climbers to get stuck into it. And uh, a nice, uh, nice haircut there on the Kelme rider, Paul. I think it was Ribera. I think he was expecting the weather to stay at 35 degrees Celsius, as it was <laughs> in the southern part of Italy. But as we go up into the mountains and the Dolomites, followed by the Alps, the temperature certainly is going to drop an awful lot. But now that leading group of six riders have been uh, limited now down to just three, and the main field picking up the pace as we approach the foot of the climb, and it's going to be very difficult indeed for these three leaders to hold off the main field. Canzonieri leading the pace here, but they really they haven't escaped the clutches of this peloton, who are moving forward with all of their big names, and also riding here at the back of the group here, number 167, Zanetta. Amazing, this guy Zanetta. He's always in the brakes. He's a very aggressive rider, but very rarely does he come up with a victory, but certainly he always looks for the breakaways. Behind on the road, the main field being led 14 seconds in arrears by the ASIC squad of Michele Bartoli and of course the overall leader at the moment, Andrea Noe, for him. A great day in the pink jersey, but there you can see the three leaders. They're in the same straight now as the main field. Well, Noe had a very good uh, Giro d'Italia last year and indeed the year before, um, but now of course he's having his best ever season with his stage victory and his one day in pink and if he wants it to be any more he's got himself in a good position here he must be feeling very nervous because he knows this climb gets a bit tough towards the end he knows the strength of people like Alex Zula and Marco Pantoni and of course Pavel Tonkov Gotti is suspiciously uh, uh, not seen at the front at all here's the wipeout moment and the main field all the pacemakers are Festina for Zula well, it's obvious then that the, these guys from Festina feel that Alex Zuller can regain the yellow, the pink jersey this afternoon because he certainly has ridden very well so far. And it was only, I think, a lapse of concentration by Festina that allowed him to lose it a couple of days ago. But for him, he realizes the important parts of the Tour of Italy is right now. The mountain top finishes are starting to come. And as well as that, we've got the time trial tomorrow. But Mape too feel that their man, Pavel Tonkov, is in ideal form to try and take the overall lead. There he is, wearing number 91. The Russian rider, former winner of the Tour of Italy, has got a very strong squad around him. The main field, Pantani, we just caught a glimpse of there. He's, what, oh, he's nearly halfway down the pack at the moment, so he's not in any mood to make an attack very early on. The Seiko boys now probably setting the pace, not for Mario Cipollini on a climb like this, but for Ivan Gotti, who is there, third wheel in the red jersey. It's very important he comes through this stage good to convince himself rather than the Tifosi that he is going OK. We're moving up into second place is Misaglia, the rider who this year won the Tour of Langkawi a long time ago, it seems now in February. A very difficult race in Malaysia, all part of the preparation of the Mape squad for this very important Tour of Italy because for them, the Tour of Italy is one of the most important races on their calendar. Andre Kivalev setting the pace. What a great first season he's had for Festina, having won the Commonwealth Bank Cycle Classic as an amateur in Australia last October, and now coming in as a late replacement for the team, having a magical season. He really is. He's won a number of smaller stage races, 
and is a real star of the future. Comes from Kazakhstan, speaks English, by the way, but keeps telling me he doesn't. On the left-hand side, you can see the yellow jersey of uh, Konishev. He, I think, is a little bit worried about being so close to the front, but realising today is an important day for Marco Pantani. He'll stay there for as long as possible to try and help his teammate. But you can see Phil this climb now certainly starting to make uh, a lot of riders' legs suffer, and Michele Bartoli feels once again that he can put the pressure on at the front of the main field. He's had an incredible first 14 days of this year's tour. Well, he's looking over his shoulder to see where the pink jersey is, if his teammate Noe. And uh, the boys are gathering around him because Mercatoni Uno have moved up on the right. 101 is Pantani and 102 is Gazzelli, Stefano Gazzelli. And uh, quite clearly Bartoli switched off Paul because he realised that Noe wasn't going with the move. He was looking to see what his teammate's position was. He didn't want to put him under too much pressure because there's an awful lot of friendship goes on in these teams. Although Michele Bartoli is regarded as the number one leader of the team, he obviously doesn't want to take the victory away, the, the pink jersey away from his teammate. And look at that, there's the pink jersey riding an incredible race this afternoon, trying to stay in contact there. And there is Lauren Rue, the man who held the pink jersey just before Noe did. But the big pressure on the front is the yellow squad here of Mercatone Uno. These guys must cringe every day they go out towards a mountain top finish because they know they're going to have to hurt themselves and destroy themselves just for their team leader, Marco Pantani. That's the name of the game. They are now getting a grip of this race and they are trying to launch Marco for the stage win. By the way, he hasn't won a stage win in the Giro since 1994 and today is the first real perfect finish for him. Well, there's Pantani there, just behind his teammate Gardzelli, and right on his wheel, Alex Zuller wearing number 78. Queuing up behind him now is Pavel Tonkov as well, because they all feel certain that very shortly Marco Pantani is going to launch that vicious attack, which is well known in the fields of international bike racing, because once he goes, it is so very difficult to follow his acceleration. Well, still, Mercatoni Uno set the pace. The rider doing the work at the front is still Garzelli. He'd like a little bit of help. And as they continue on the climb, it looks as though Focconi has got on the front now and Pantani is the next man. When you run out of pacemakers, you have to do it yourself, so wait for a sudden acceleration. It could come at any moment. Oh, dear me, Gotti's in trouble, and this is not what he wanted to see. Well, this was supposed to be the big day for Gotti. He's ridden a perfect tour so far. He's been sitting there in the main field, allowing Mario Cipollini to take the limelight, but there's the attack we were waiting for. Marco Pantani has gone, and Pavel Tonkov has gone with him. Oh, and Pavel Tonkov just concentrating there. Not even daring to look too far ahead. He's just thinking and concentrating and holding on to that wheel of Marco Pantani. The attack that everybody knew would come sooner or later. And once you run out of workhorses, you've got to do it yourself. And that's why Pantani is so good. He can. Well, Pantani waiting for the steepest part of this climb before he launched his attack, and the steepest part is 13%. It steadies out a little bit as you get towards the summit, but the steep part of the lower part of the climb here is certainly playing into the hands of Marco Pantani, and one man who wasn't able to follow that acceleration was Alex Zuller. Well, Zuller and also the pink jersey of Noe, we we're not expecting him to win the Tour of Italy, but we thought he might show some resistance, but he hasn't shown any at all. And Tonkov has sat up and slowed down. He's gone into the zone he can't cope with, and he's having to slow to recover, while Pantani just sits there like all good climbers and pedals. What a remarkable climber he is. You can see the plaster on his right knee there, the sequel of his crash yesterday on that very dangerous descent down to the finish line, but that doesn't seem to have had any effect on his bike pedaling ability this afternoon because every time he slows and doesn't feel happy with the speed, he gets out of the saddle and accelerates. In contrast to the style here of Pavel Tonkov, he uses a very big gear, uses his power to try and keep rolling up the mountain. The style of Pantani is much more explosive. But it's not just the stage when he wants today, Paul. He's also thinking of getting time gaps. With the time trial coming tomorrow, the likes of Tomkov and, of course, uh, Zuller uh, should put time into him in the time trial. And so he's trying now to show a little bit of resistance, and hats off to him for that. Gotti still in trouble, and uh, Pantani at 10K to go, and the gap is opening. Well, Pavel Tonkov riding just for him what is already a time trial, just trying to make sure he doesn't lose too much time on the acceleration of Marco Pantani, and the gaps further down starting to open. Leading them round there in third position on the road is, in fact, Alex Zullard. He's followed by Guerini, and a little further back in this group, I thought I caught a sight earlier on of Luc Leblanc. There he is sitting on the back, and one man disappearing from the top of the leaderboard in the Tour of Italy this year is Ivan Gotti. 
He's the big loser on this stage at the moment, and the man who stands most to gain at two is Marco Pantani. Just keeps out of the saddle, hardly any body movement, just makes those legs pump a little bit harder. Tonkov is still riding ahead of the chase group where Zula is in, and so too is the Maglia Rosa of Noe. We can have a look for ourselves now. There's a couple of riders trying to get off the front. Uh, one, as you say, is Luc Leblanc, and the other one is Zula. So they are trying to get on terms, at least with Tonkov. In fact, it wasn't uh, Luc Leblanc. He's been replaced there by Guerini. Luc Leblanc obviously not able to follow the acceleration there of Alex Zula, but it's a remarkable performance here by Marco Pantani. He's been omnipresent, really, since the very first week of this Giro d'Italia. He's always been looking for the moves, but it's amazing. I'm always surprised at the style of Pavel Tonkov when he rides a mountain here because he never seems to be under pressure. He just seems to ride at his very own pace. Well, there is Pavel, his mouth wide open, and the crowd know him well here. He's Since he, he moved from Russia into Italy, he has been a star of the Tour of Italy every time he's taken part. Uh, we first noted him when he won a stage of the Milk Race, the, the old British uh, Tour of Britain in Nottingham a few years back, when he was riding for the famous Red Guard of the Soviet Union. Ten seconds, the gap between the two. Well, that's not an awful lot of an advantage for Marco Pantani to take over Pavel Tonkov. And you see Tonkov is not panicking. He's riding sensibly, keeping his tempo well within his own range. He knows what sort of level he can ride at. He didn't want to try and match the acceleration of Marco Pantani because he realizes that nobody can. And a little bit further behind him, 14 seconds in fact, is Alex Zuller and uh, Garini there wearing number 141 of Palti. So the race still very much in a handful of seconds. Well, it did appear that they were coming up to Tonkov, but I think he settled down. He's gone through that patch where he's now got his second breath uh, because Pantani is not racing away for him at all. And Tonkov really was very wise there when he dropped back. He realized he couldn't go into the sort of zones where Pantani lives. But Pantani, again, isn't ripping away from the field like he's done in the passport. He certainly isn't. He's not opened up the massive gaps. But I think it's because as we get to the summit of this climb, just five kilometers remaining, we're getting onto the actually slightly easier slopes of this mountain top. That's why he's not managed to open up the big gaps on Pavel Tonkov. And there in front, you can just see the car of Mercatone Uno. And it is still hovering around the 10 second mark. The clock telling us it's 14. And Tonkov riding sensibly, riding in a very good rhythm indeed. But just behind Tonkov, Alex Zuller has made a very good recovery. Well, Zuller, you know, if he continues to hold Pantani, he is going to reclaim the leader's jersey because he's got about 20 or 30 seconds now in hand over Noe. If he reclaims the pink jersey, he'll be doing it for, well, he'll be reclaiming it for the second time. It'll be the third time this tour he's actually won it. Marco Pantani is not worried about pink jerseys or anything at the moment. All he's worried about is staying in front of these riders. In fact, Zolo has ridden sensibly. He's caught Pavel Tonkov, and they're joined by Garini. But there you can see, again, although Marco Pantani made the attack much earlier down the slope, he hasn't opened up very much of an advantage. It's now 15 seconds, but he's doing an awful lot of work to try and get a few seconds advantage over the rest of the group. Well, it's all over for Pantani. He's going to win the stage, and that's a first of four years, and what a four years it's been in between with his terrible accidents, and he's come out of it so well to get back to the top. He wins the stage of the Giro d'Italia. That'll mean an awful lot to him. And as he comes in, the clock starts, and it shouldn't be too long before we see the arrival of Zula, Guirini and Tonkov. And the cheeky Tonkov has found the strength to take second, Zula third there. Well, that will, should be good enough now. We're waiting for the arrival of Noah. He's a long way back. That should be good enough now to give Alex. Here comes Noah. Well, just under two minutes back, so Alex Zula reclaims the rider's pink jersey, and that is absolutely formidable. But uh, Marco Pantani quite clearly is a threat in this year's Giro d'Italia, even though the time trials may not run in his favour, and they certainly will run in the favour of Alex Zula, and tomorrow he has a real chance now of increasing his overall lead in the time trial. And the new leader in the King of the Mountains, Marco Pantani.
And so we've come to the moment of truth, the 15th stage, the individual time trial. The rider's moving down to Trieste now, which is over towards the borders of the old Yugoslavia. And it is there now where the rider will face up to a 40 kilometres time trial, 25 miles. There's a climb which takes them up to the 11 and a half kilometre point, and then it gently rolls off the hill down to the flat finish. It's a beautiful day. All we want now is to see how the stars in the first big test will come out of it. This is the situation. Pantani now 22 seconds. That's all behind the new leader Zula, Tonkov, the ever-present Tonkov is third, Guerini because of that ride is up into fourth and you know you mustn't underrate Guerini, he's a good rider in the Giro d'Italia. Well this is the star Paul of Pavel Tonkov. That's the first chance we've seen of these magnificent bicycles and out there on the course this is the blade, the bicycle that was in fact designed for Miguel Indurain several years ago, Lespada they called it in Spanish and this is the chance a lot of riders have to try and prove themselves to be in good form but in the early part of the race a lot of riders finding the 40 kilometers, 25 miles very difficult indeed but the latter starters, men like Marco Pantani realized that it's so important for him to try and do something special but out on the course coming in with the fast Fastest time is the man who always puts a good time in in the time trials. Sergei Gonchar comes to the line with a new best time of 45 minutes and 31 seconds. Well, that's going to be the marker. Even Pantani may not, and I would say should not, get towards that time. Gonchar uh, shot to the fore last year in the Giro d'Italia with a great time trial. He went on to become a medalist in the World Time Trial Championship. Now he's in with the best time for the 40 kilometers. Back to Tonkov. Well, Tonkov, a man uh, capable of putting in a very good time trial, but the man, I think, who must certainly be one of the big favourites for this stage has to be Alex Zuller. He'll be starting in last position, and that will give him the advantage of knowing what the intermediary times are of all the other riders. And here he is coming off the starting ramp right now, resplendent in the pink jersey and on a very fast time trial machine. And right in front of him on the road is going to be Pavel Tonkov. Well, Big Alex knows what it's like to be a world champion of the time trial. And uh, now we're looking at the big boys all out on the course, separated only by their start time here. And remember, Gonchar is in with the best time, and that's a marker. Here comes Michele Bartoli, not surprisingly slipping down. This is a, this is a partway check here, Paul. Uh, plus 36 seconds, so he's fourth at partway. That's a pretty good performance by Bartoli. It certainly is, but it's the early part of the course when you have to get into your rhythm straight away, and Alex Zuller looks very comfortable on this early climb. As you said, it takes him up to 11 and a half kilometers, and then it's 30 kilometers down to the finish. Here's an intermediary check, though, for Andrea Noah, the early leader. He goes through in fourth place, almost one and a quarter minutes off the mark. Well, Zula is riding very strongly. The checks are indicating he is nibbling a short lead here. Gonchar is the leader who's won the time trial stage for the past two years. Don't forget, Tonkov, 1.4 seconds down, Paul. That's not a lot as we see the arrival of Belly. Well, Belly thinking more about the days to come and the work he's going to have to do for the overall leader, Alex Zula. He comes through in 20th place, 2 minutes, 45 seconds off the leaderboard. But Marco Pantani is coming up to the intermediary point there. We'll get a chance to see just how well Pantani is riding in a discipline that he normally doesn't like very much. So Pantani a little bit off the pace here. It's 11th place and losing ground. All these riders are pretty hot time trial riders. Pantani, don't forget, may have used a lot of energy yesterday to that mountain top finish. He's going through 17th at the moment, over 73 seconds down on Gonchar, who has finished. Huge crowds here now waiting to see what Alex Zula can do as he will head up now towards that same checkpoint. At the moment, though, it is uh, Gonchar, Tonkov, and Carlos Dominguez, by the way, is third best. Look at this, Zula still inside the time of Sergei Gonchar, a winner last year of a stage, a time trial stage in the Tour of Italy. And this is the terrain that Alex Zula really can excel in the time trial. He's a specialist at that, he's been the world champion, and he's well inside the time set by Gonchar early on at this intermediary point at half distance. Well, Gonchar, remember, lost uh, the world title to Lange Jalabert last year. And look at that, he's gone 36 seconds to the good. So Zula is riding a superb time trial. And if he keeps this up with the toughest part behind him, he's going to increase his overall lead over the others. We're looking again at Tonkov. He was second on the road, he's now third powerful rider. Oscar Kamen's in the champion of uh, Switzerland coming up to the line as well. A great performance by him going across in fifth place but one minute 38 seconds off the leader but out on the course I have to tell you Phil Alex Zula looking very good another good performance coming in Michele Bartoli second for him.
Wow, in fact, third as he slips up, one minute, 18 seconds down. Look at the speed of here of Tonkov, 56.7 kilometers an hour. You know, if Zulu is going quicker, then we are on to see the fastest ever time trial in the history of the Giro d'Italia. And looking there at the figure of Marco Pantani, a little further down the road, in fact, you will see the pink jersey on the shoulders of Alex Zuller, who started two minutes behind him in this time trial, and now he's got the fantastic sight of having the leader of the King of the Mountains right in front of him. And that will spur him on, because that means he will at least get a two-minute advantage over the little climber from Pantani. Well, the roads are nice and wide, they're very flat, the sun is up in the sky, it's a warm day, and Pavel Tonkov it should be second best when he gets the line. Andre Noah comes in, 21st for him. So his race will continue, and the capture here of Pantoni by Zula, and he flies by him. This is an incredible piece of performance here. Alex Zula cutting a path towards victory in the Giro d'Italia, even with the mountains that are still to come. Incredible speed by Alex Zuller there, and I think Marco Pantani will be reasonably happy to the fact that he's only lost two minutes so far on a man at the specialist at this kind of event, Alex Zuller. Zuller flying along here, well in excess of 55 kilometers an hour, looking very calm and collected and in control of the situation. And all Pantani can do now is try and keep the flying Swiss rider in his sights. The face of Pavel Tonkov, the winner of this tour two years ago, Gotti now out of it and no chance of repeating his victory of last year. Tonkov, the obvious candidate. The best time in is Sergei Gonchar. Uh, Tonkov is coming in. He's behind Gonchar and he's going to slot in third place at the moment. He won't be too happy with that. Marco Pantani still can see the shadow in front of him of the pink jersey. Alex Zuller, a big armada of machines right behind him. The advantage now of Zuller around about 250 meters, but Zuller really pushing as much as he can into that big chain ring he's got on the front there. 56 tooth is that 56 tooth on the mid front chain ring, and I would think his smallest sprocket at the back is going to be around about 11. So that will be an incredibly big gear that he's just making mince meat out of. Well, Zulla will now be the next rider to finish in the overall classification as he continues now. Tonkov is in, he's caught Pantani. Pantani's going to keep him in his sights at all costs. But even so, Zulla has pulled away. There's the time of Gonchar. And there is the time of Alex Zulla. Tonkov now comes on the screen. I think there's something actually wrong with the timings here. 45-38 for Alex Zulla. I actually think that is wrong. And Zulla has produced the best time of the day. And we'll get confirmation of that, I'm sure. The scream is wrong. I think they're wrong when they put Tonkov's time up. They're slightly out of sync, I think. That's out of our control, as now the arrival of Marco Pantani heading up towards the finish. And, uh, in fact, uh, Alex Zula has been declared the winner. His time amended, so we're not sure what Pantani's doing now, but they're giving him 24th place at the moment. The time of Alex Zula, and there it is amended, 44.38. That is a record average speed for any of the Giro d'Italia time trials. The previous best by the way was Yevgeny Berzin a few years ago. So Zula beats Gonchar and Tonkov and Carlos Dominguez is the other rider. So Alex Zula has increased his overall lead in the Giro d'Italia in two days of excellent racing but of course with the Dolomites still to come and therefore you can never count out Marco Pantani who may be the leader of the King of the Mountains but he really does want to win the Giro d'Italia. And what about Pavel Tonkov, Paul, because he's a man who is really looking good. But going into the last week of this Giro, Phil, I have to tell you one thing. Alex Zuller is looking very confident indeed. Tactically, he's ridden perfectly, but certainly he's put a lot of effort into that first 10 days of this race, and I feel that he may well pay for it a little later on. Tonkov certainly looking like a possible future winner. And almost 68 hours in the saddle now for the race leader, Alex Zula. The other's that little bit slower. Pavel Tonkov lying second. Marco Pantani is third. And a little bit uphill today towards the end as the riders move away on the 16th stage from Udine to Asiago. Tomorrow, of course, is the day they fear most in the high mountains. And there may be a few rather tired legs today, Paul, especially after that time trial yesterday. It's always a very strange stage racing after a time trial because a lot of the big he heads of state of the, the world of cycling tend to push themselves a lot more than the lesser riders. And that's why a day after a time trial like that, you can very often see a breakaway going clear. Well, seven times so far, the leadership has changed in the Giro d'Italia. Alex Zulla has got it back again, defending his lead. That two minutes, two seconds over Tonkov. 
And of course, Pantani hovering dangerously so, one has to say, in third place. The riders taking a gentle ride out here now as they head out towards the start of the race. The weather is good, the sun is high in the sky, and I think one or two riders will hope today to have a fairly easy ride down to the finishing line because the Marmalada is the big mountain tomorrow, and that will be an absolute brute. And there's the fly past of the Italian uh, jets uh, going over the top, much to the movement of Oscar Camazin. They don't have many aeroplanes left in the Swiss Air Force. Well, this is the first time, Phil, we've actually seen a stage like this, which I think is why the riders are enjoying the fly past of the Tricolore of Italy there, because uh, really we've seen very fast stages so far, and I think they're all quite happy to cruise along the airstrip here and just enjoy the sights. Well, there's the Italian colour, and it's just a sign of anger. The pilots want to land, and the Giro d'Italia is on the runway here. As the riders now make their way out to the start, the pink jersey, even Alex Zuller is being amused by the situation. But that's not the way it's going to stay. The race now underway, and the riders heading another long stage, this over 230 kilometres down towards the finish. And once the uh, victory can be smelt on the nostrils of these riders, they go out and really put the pressure on. And once again, you can see the big long line here of a breakaway that's got clear. They've managed to steal away from the rest of the big heads of state of this year's Giro d'Italia because everybody realises that a lot of the big men in this race will be thinking about the big mountain stage tomorrow. Well, throughout the day, none of the top riders have been involved in the big moves. And so there's a breakaway gone and nobody really affecting the break. There's the escape gap, 16 plus minutes. People like Piccolini are in here. Uh, Bettini's in here, Ferigato, Fontanelli, uh, Nicola Loder, good finisher there. Uh, Klaus Moller is even here from Denmark. He's on the TVM team, by the way. Uh, but nobody really, well, there's somebody launched an attack, but nobody affecting the overall classification. Well, this group is 1 minute 13 seconds behind that leading group of riders, and they were originally part of that leading group, but it's just split to pieces for the moment, and everybody scrambling to try and survive on this very tough stage. Well, Fontanelli here is trying to get away. And what might be worth remembering, Paul, that Fabio Fontanelli won the 16th stage of the Giro d'Italia last year, and this is stage 16 now. And he's at the head of this rather large group of riders, and he's trying to reduce the size of it. A little bit of a problem for the Kelmy rider out on the course. This is uh, Ochoa Palacios, well, his 23-year-old Spanish rider on the Kelmy team, trying to ride away from the group now. And chasing him here, number 22, is Paolo Bettini. He's had his lead in the King of the Mountains. Here's where the attack came, Bettini with him. Bettini's still scoring a few points in the King of the Mountains. Well, in fact, he's uh, lost the lead in that competition to Marco Pantani, and I don't think uh, anybody can uh, say that Marco Pantani doesn't deserve to be the leader of the King of the Mountains. And there you can see the gap that they have over the group containing the leader of the race, Alex Zuller, 15 minutes and 40 seconds. Well, these are the boys enjoying today's stage of the Giro, while the top boys are having a little bit of a rest here. Fontinelli's number 106. They're still throwing in the weight behind this breakaway, but the top riders languishing 16 minutes behind, of course, remembering that tomorrow brings in uh, the climb of the Fedaya Marbolada, which comes at 175 kilometres, a first category climb. And after that, the Cima Coppi, the highest point of the Giro d'Italia, at over 2,000 metres. So a very tough day in store for everybody on tomorrow's stage, which is why these riders who expect to just try and finish tomorrow's stage are out pushing themselves to the limit. Mario Cipollini there, happy to ride very close to the front of the group. He won't be looking for the stage victory today because still the advantage of that leading group of riders well up on a quarter of an hour. Well, at least Mario's still in the Giro d'Italia at this stage of the race. Sometimes he's given up by now. This is the composition of the breakaway. All the Italian flags there, except Klaus Moller of Denmark, uh, breaking up the sequence. And this break knows that they're going to succeed today. It's a question of just planning who, which one of them is going to win. Look at that speed. You can see just how tough this final few kilometres is. 27 kilometres an hour. That's just a shade under 18 miles an hour. So uh, certainly this has been a very tough final 50 kilometres to the stage. And we've climbed up to around about 1,000 metres. We're on a plateau at the moment. And there's no flat section at all now on this course as we head down towards the finish line. Well, there's nine riders in the breakaway, and we should have seen the Spanish flag on that caption as well, because there is one rider from Spain here, one from Denmark, and the rest from Italy. 
And Bettini's gone again. He wants to get out of this group of nine riders because he realizes that's the best chance he's got of getting a stage victory if he can do it alone. But nobody after this long breakaway where they've all been together working very well to build up that magic lead of almost a quarter of an hour now have been working well together. Nobody's shirked at all from the work that's necessary to make a success of a group like this. Well, the rider sitting right off the front of the group there is Cassani from the Palti team. And just coming up behind him there, it looks as though we've got Mariano Piccoli. Oh, the Spanish flag is at the bottom. I might have missed it last time. I don't think it was there. But anyway, it is now. And this is the breakaway. There's still a lot of cat and mouse going on here because there's so much time in hand over the field and none are in contention for the Maglia Rosa. No, but they're all in contention, of course, for the win with 15 kilometres to go. We're onto a sort of plateau now with a few ripples that will take the riders over to the finish. Well, Alex Zuller seems very happy there in the pink jersey with the way the race has evolved today. Give him a chance to just recuperate a little bit from the effort he put in yesterday to win that time trial and extend his lead in the overall standings. But at the front, it really is uh, no holes barred here because everybody is trying to get off the front and win this stage as we head into the town now of Asiago. Just a little split in the field here. The Kelme rider sitting at the back of the group. Moller is still here, the Danish rider. But there's a little bit of a scampering away from the front of the group here now. As they go, we've got Bettini, uh, Syria, Mario Syria is here, the Seiko rider, there he is on the front, the big Seiko man. And uh, Fontanelli is the little rider tucked in at the back. Remember, to the very stage a year ago, he was the winner, and he looks as though he's getting himself into a nice position. This is Paolo Bettini. Bettini looks very nervous. He doesn't want the other group of the riders behind to come back up to them here. He feels more at an advantage just having two men to watch, but in the main field, no real chase there being organized at all as we look here at Fontanelli, keeping the pressure on, making sure that the six riders behind don't come back because he too is a very good finisher, winner last year of two stages of the Tour of Lankawi, and at the moment, just keeping an eye over his shoulder to see what the advantage is over that group behind. Mario Shiria not willing to uh, offer more than he has to to the breakaway. Fontanelli, a crafty rider, taking a look at uh, Paolo Bettini. And it's one kilometre from the line now. Bettini really doesn't want to be number one anymore. He wants to slip behind them. And the other two, of course, are having none of it. Three Italians in at the last shout. Well, the big man on the back there wearing number nine, Mario Sierra, normally a lead-out man for Mario Cipollini. He's the kind of guy who should wind the sprint up from a long way out, 800 metres to go, looking over his shoulder, and in fact, it's Bettini the first to move. Well, he's gone very, very early. I think he's seen the left-hander in front, but he's eased right back again, and Fontanelli's come back into the lead now. Fontanelli can see the front of the race now, and he's going to give everything, but he's now... Bettini has got it first, gritting his teeth and going for it. Fontanelli has got Bettini's wheel, and looks though like the big Shiria isn't going to get in on the act here, but can Fontanelli get off the back wheel of Bettini? And I think he can. Stage 16, two years in a row. Fabio Fontanelli gets the stage at 25 miles an hour, the average speed today. Nothing to write home about. Flashing over the line there in uh, fourth place is Mario Piccoli. Piccoli. So he keeps getting uh, points in that competition. Ferregato fifth, Loder sixth, and Cassani seventh. None of the men that matter on the result, Paul, because they're still coming in. They're still a long way behind. A good day for Alex Zola. Nothing to worry about, nothing to write home about either. Putting his team, Festina, on the front to control affairs, thinking about the tactics for tomorrow. But a great move by Fontanelli. Perfectly timed here. Bettini panicked a little bit, let it out, and Fontanelli was in an ideal position just to come off his shoulder and get himself the second win on stage 16 two years in a row but in the end of course Alex Zula coming in in this back group will keep his pink jersey on the eve of the toughest stage that's what they're saying of this year's Giro d'Italia certainly a stage which crosses the highest mountains so we come to the stage they've talked about uh, long ago, where even when the tour route was announced, 17th stage from Asiago to Selva di Valgardina, 200 plus kilometers. This is the overall situation as we go into the mountains today. Tonkov looking for 202, Bettini is third, Pantani is down to fourth. Uh, well, I say down the fourth, but he's been a challenger throughout this race. There's his team, and Paul, he knows today has to be his day. 
A very difficult stage and all the mountains really packed in the second half of the course. 100 kilometers from the finish is when all the big climbs start and already riders out there trying to toughen it up. Riders who feel that they've got a chance of stealing an advantage over the big climbers. We're looking here at one of the riders on the new team. This is Buena Hora riding for Vitalico Siguros from Spain, a man who's always ridden well here in the Tour of Italy and the Tour de France. A great climber, but certainly the hammer will come down behind Phil because we have got the Paso di Mama Molada, the ride, the climb that many of these riders fear, and almost straight after that, the Passo di Sella, which this year is the Cima Coppi, the highest point of the Giro d'Italia, 2,200 meters. And the other two riders here, Kepi Gonzalez and Oscar Kamazin, they're the early pacemakers. An interesting move that Tonkov has told Kamazin to start trying and drawing the string early on these riders. But the news at the start this morning, uh, Ivan Gotti not among the starters. He says his form just isn't there, it's not a shadow of what it was last year, and he still complains of stomach sickness. He certainly hasn't managed to get the form back that brought him the victory in the Tour of Italy last year, and he suffered all through the season. And now they're suffering a lot today as well. His Paolo Bettini, the man who was out on the attack yesterday, and that group, which was around about 140 riders on the start line this morning, is down to a very select group of 30 riders. And Alex Zulla in the pink jersey there, looking very comfortable at the front of the main group. Well, our climbs today going over 2,200 meters. And so that's some of the reason of 7,000 plus feet. And the riders know they have a real tough day and decision time is here. Dmitry Konishev in the center of our picture, the rider who was the first Russian rider, or well, the first Soviet Union rider to pull on the King of the Mountains leader's jersey in the Tour de France. Tonkov decides to lift the pace a little bit. The first test, perhaps. Tonkov, very strong rider. He's definitely not a pure climber, but he climbs with power second in the overall standings, two minutes and two seconds behind Alex Zulla. And obviously the team to react is going to be Festina. They're not going to let Pavel Tonkov ride away like that but in that group one man missing from the front of that group in fact Phil was Marco Pantani not riding up towards the front with the other big leaders well you know he's gonna have to go early if he does anything at all on this stage he doesn't finish up a mountain which is not really his favorite it finishes almost downhill in fact and uh, it, here's Pantani now who climbed his way through with his usual rhythm fourth overall three minutes 48 it's a big task to bridge 348 to a man like Alex Zula he makes his way up now to the back wheel of Tonkov and right behind him there is Giuseppe Guerini who finished third overall last year in the Giro. Amazing the ease with which Marco Pantani rides up and down these groups in the mountains. One minute he's sitting right at the back and when he feels there's a certain amount of danger he just cruises up right round the outside and puts himself into an ideal position to keep an eye on what's going on. But it looks as if Alex Zuller is suffering a little bit because he's not quite on the wheel of the rider in front of him but this is a chance to see the big power of Pavel Tonkov. Well, Zula said last night he's not sure he will still lead the tour by the end of tomorrow, and that's now today, as uh, indeed Pantani has started that relentless rhythm again to see how many riders he can break. Pantani loves climbing. Once he's got a chance of getting to the front of a small group like this, he just pu puts the pressure on it and accelerates to see who can follow the, the incredible changes of speed that he's got on these big mountain slopes, looking very concentrated at the moment. There's still a breakaway of the road of three riders, and one of those is Kamenzin, which is a very good tactical move, really, by the Mape squad, because if Tonkov can get up to Kamenzin, then the Mape squad is going to have the advantage of numbers. But look at this. You can't see the pink jersey of Alex Zulla following the pace. Well, if you're not feeling good, there he is down there, Paul. And if you're not feeling good, today is not the day to wear the pink jersey. He knows that Pantani is moving clear with uh, Gotti, and well, with Gotti, with Tonkov, of course, and with Ghirini. Here they are, and Tonkov still making good pace making here. But this group is moving clear on the Marmalada. They're picking up the stragglers now of the early breakaways, and they're not going to stay with them at all. They're going to drop back. But Pantani looks across at the rider he's just passed there, looking over to see where Alex Zuller is, and Zuller is a long way down the road at the moment, suffering to get his condition, suffering to get into any kind of rhythm to control the, uh, the pace that be, that's being set currently by Marco Pantani. And Pantani, it always amazes me, Phil, to see him on the slopes of these climbs. It just looks so easy when he gets out of the saddle. Those legs of his just flow around a very fluid motion. Well, here comes little Kepi Gonzalez, who's a real great climber. And these are the last two survivors up front now, Paul, and, and looking here on the face of the Vitalico rider, he's not feeling too happy at all. 
Two Colombians at the head of affairs now, Buena Hora and Kepi Gonzalez. They know each other very well indeed, and certainly they will be getting information of what is happening behind, and the big reaction is coming from Marco Pantani, who needs, if he wants to climb further up the overall standings, to put a lot of time between himself and men like Tonkov and Alex Zula. Just look at the massive crowd here on the mid-slopes of the Marmolada, going as far as the eye can see up to what is the snow line to date, and they're going to be given the usual treatment by Pantani. They'll see Il Parato in action, and they're picking up one by one the riders of that breakaway and dispatching them back towards the peloton. And very soon, Pantani and Ghirini, and I'm not too sure what sure what's happened to Tonkop, but I'm presuming he's been dropped. Uh, they're going to make their way forward. Pantani just sits there, there you can see now, in fact, Tonkov has been joined by Alex Zula. So Zula riding himself into the, some form of rhythm on this climb here, but in great difficulty trying to match any of the pace that has been set by Marco Pantani on the early slopes of this climb. Well, it's a time for Pantani to get his own back on Zula after that time trial when Zula came flying by him, clearly almost a third uh, quicker than he was going. Now we're on the mountain, and now Pantani can hurt Zula here. But Zula is a clever rider. He's not a man to panic. He's never one to say he can ride alongside Pantani. The thing is to find your own rhythm and climb this mountain at your speed. And with the strength and the talent of Zula, he should be able to ride past the majority of the riders. Well, the man doing the job at the moment is 141 guy Sieppe Guerini, who's still managing to stay in the slipstream of Marco Pantani. But I tell you one thing, the crowd certainly love this man. They're going crazy. They want Pantani to walk away with the Tour of Italy today. And he certainly is putting a lot of his adversaries into difficulties on the slopes of this climb, the Marmolada. Well, you know, Guerini had a great tour last year he, he took over the job of team leader after Luc Leblanc slammed into that wall in the time trial and eventually retired from the race when he was right up there on a podium finish and he came up to finish in third place and get a pony in place so he's a very good rider Guirini and once you've proved that you can do it then very often you come back and you repeat the feat and right now he knows if he controls Marco Pantani and goes with Marco Pantani you can see the gaps that Pantani is opening and then Guirini can start dreaming of a high podium place again. One kilometer to go to the summit of the Col de Marmolada. That is Kepi Gonzalez still with a one minute 45 second advantage over the chasers. And not even a worry on the uh, on the thought of Marco Pantani here. He's just trying to set the pace as much as he can to make sure that he can open up as much advantage on the guys behind him. He's not worried about Kepi Gonzalez. Gonzalez here thinking more about the possibility of getting over the top of this climb and keeping his advantage on the way towards the finish line. Well, there's this beautiful climb here, the Marmalade, and all of the, uh, the riders fear, except, of course, if your name is Marco Pantani. And uh, Kepi Gonzalez climbing very, very well here. And uh, he's the last survivor of the breakaway now, and he's being chased by all of the top riders. Look at this, 13% of really steep climb when you bear in mind that they've been climbing this climb for 22 kilometers so far. And you can see the snow line at the top and Alex Zuller looking across the, the corners to see if he can see what kind of disadvantage he's got over the leaders on the road and see if he can just see the shape of Marco Pantani on one of the higher climbs up this mountain because he knows now that he really has to put himself into difficulty to try and make sure he can keep the pink jersey on his shoulders as Kepi Gonzalez now here approaches the summit of this very difficult climb, the, the Paso de Fidea Marmolada. And the Tifosi enjoying their day. One rider who has been dropped and is reported to be right down at the end of the field is Michele Bartoli. Another man who has abandoned the race is Mario Cipollini, and uh, so he's not getting over the mountains again in this Giro. Well, that's a big surprise because I thought Mario Cipollini was looking very comfortable over the last couple of days, but certainly he wasn't too happy when the rain and the cold weather came down on this year's Tour of Italy. As we come to the top of the climb, we get a chance now to see what sort of deficit Marco Pantani has over the leader, Kepi Gonzalez, and it's 1 minute 19 seconds over the summit of that climb, and there's still, Phil, an awful long way to go to the finish. It's around about 30 k's from the finish line. Well, hats off to Alex Zuller, the way he's riding here at the moment, because he looks to me, Paul, as though he's actually finding his rhythm again, even though the gap is opening, and that pink jersey could now be transferring across 
uh, to Marco Pantani, but even if that is to be the case, with the time trial still to come, Zola could take that jersey back for a fourth time. What he has to do now is to make sure that he doesn't panic, to keep riding sensibly well within his limits, so on the flatter part of the course, he can actually recover and pull a bit of time back. But there is three minutes and eight seconds behind the leader, so that puts him around about two minutes behind Marco Pantani. Well, fine piece of tempo by Zola, and hats off to him in that case. The rider still there riding with him is Leonardo Pipoli, who is another great climber. And uh, really the man on the Seiko team now because the stars have gone, Cipollini and Gotti. Well, really, they came to this uh, race as the defending champions last year. They had Mario Cipollini take the points classification and Ivan Gotti take the pink jersey all the way up to Milano. And this year, they've really been devastated by the tough climbs here in the mountains. But this is Oscar Kamens in here trying to get across and put himself back up to Kepi Gonzalez. Earlier on, he was with Gonzalez, and he will probably very shortly see the green jersey on the shoulders of Marco Pantani coming up to him. I'd completely forgotten about Kamens in. We hadn't seen him for a while, but there he is. He's still lying second on on the road and still in a very good position to go forward here with this breakaway as they begin to merge. Well, they picked up Buena Hora, so still two riders in front of them. This is Kepi Gonzalez, a little bit further behind him. It's going to be Kamenzind, and then the big group with Marco Pantani, who certainly are eating up the road now as they attempt the first descent here off the Marmalada. They'll be thinking very seriously about the next big climb of the day, the Simacopi, the Paso di Sella, which goes up to 2,200 meters. Well, we'll see how the riders tackle that. The general opinion is the Marmalade is the tougher of the two climbs, but the other one is certainly higher. And we're forming at the front now a group of five riders. Kamazin jumps on the back wheel there of, um, of the uh, Vitilis of Buena Here. It is the Colombian rider. And then Guirini and Pantani. Well, that'll be somewhat of a shock for Kamenzin because he would have expected his own man Tonkov to be in that group. In fact, Tonkov is, was riding very well on the early slopes of this climb and a lot further back down the main field is Alex Zuller trying to make sure that he doesn't panic. He's got a very good group with him here now so they'll all work together and try and limit their losses when they come to the bottom of the very next tough climb. Well, Pantani is not going to give them a chance now if he can avoid it. He's gone very early. He had to use the climb of the Monta, uh, Marmalada. Now he can, if he can increase his climb on the next one, we're passing through the feed station here of uh, Can Can Canesi, I think the town is called, as the riders race through. The time gap, I presume, now is on Zuller's group behind Pantani. This is Tonkov going through here, one minute, 18 seconds right. behind the leader, and Zuller a lot further back. You can see now two minutes, 19 seconds to Alex Zuller. So the race starting to come back a little bit together because at one moment, Kepi Gonzalez had an advantage of over three minutes, but he hasn't got any advantage now because the green jersey on the shoulders of the king of the mountains of this year's Giro d'Italia, Marco Pantani, has pulled him back into the fold. And Pantani still must gain in excess of a minute and 20 seconds to get that pink jersey away from Alex Zula. Zula is riding a very clever race today. He's not trying to kill himself to hold Pantani. I think he accepts he can't do that, but he can limit his losses and maybe save the day. It's all down to Pantani and how much he can gain. Pantani hasn't got any friends in this group here. Garini sitting on his wheel. Two Colombians in there, Buena Hora and Kepi Gonzalez. And of course, Oscar Kamenz in the champion of Italy, of Switzerland. He's not going to give any help at all to the flying El Pirata. Not when he's the teammate of Pavel Tonkov, who is still behind. But I tell you what, Kamenzin has been quite a, a revelation in the race here. A former winner of the Tour of Switzerland and also the national champion of his country. Now beginning to move smoothly into the big time of cycling. So I think he's a third year pro. Well, there's a problem here with Marco Pantani's. Uh, in fact, his chains, chains off, come chains off. off. He, he looked as if he knew that was going to happen. He slowed down, moved to one side, and very quickly behind the team car, the team mechanic stopped, and he's up away. And I don't think very many people are going to ride away from Marco Pantani on this climb here as he picks <laughs> his way up through straight past Buena Hora. Who looks as though he's hit the wall the way he was going there. He'd slowed right down. Further down the slopes, we've got the pink jersey here, uh, trying to just uh, keep things as they are at the minute. Tonkov is with him. Right on his shoulder in the yellow jersey there, the man who won a stage of the Alpe d'Huez is his first ever victory as a professional, Roberto Conti. But up the field, this is a great piece of racing by Marco Pantani. Kepi Gonzalez tried to take advantage of that little mechanical incident, as did Garini, who was just a little bit around the corner in front of Marco Pantani. But no panic for the Italian.
Talking to Conti there, Paul, he said his first ever victory. I think it's still the only victory he's ever had. Not a bad one to put on your list, though, is it? If you're going to <laughs> if you're gonna win one race in your career, it might as well be the Al Duez. And Absolutely. certainly Roberto Conti will think about that victory for many years to come. But now he's a great teammate to have for Marco Pantani because he's the kind of rider who is solid whenever it comes to these big three-week races. And Pantani pulling himself very easily back to the front of this race and catching up with Guarini. So the head of the race as they continue to climb through this beautiful valley here in the South Tyrolean mountains. And uh, Pantani free as a bird right now. It's all down to him now. He's got rid of the boys. Can he leave them behind? These are the three front runners, Guirini and Kepi Gonzalez. Bueno Hora hit the wall. I'm a bit surprised about that because he's a good climber, but he's dropped off the pace. He certainly exploded once uh, they got to the, the foot of this climb here, the Paso de Sella, and uh, he really disappeared very rapidly indeed. The man trying to pull himself back into the race, not very far behind Marco Pantani on the road, is the man who was the former winner of this event, Pavel Tonkov, riding a sensible pace for him, around about one minute in front of Alex Zulla, who has got no friends at all in this group. Now we cross the road here and move on to the continuation of this climb where it gets a little bit steeper and 20 kilometers to go to the line. Still a long way. That's still a long chance for Pantoni to build on his lead. Remember, once we see that lead climb up over, uh, over 3 minutes 48 seconds over Zulla, then Pantoni will literally be in the pink. Well, he's 1 minute and 30 seconds up on Pavel Tonkov at the moment. This is the Alex Zuller group with two riders from Mapei in there as well. But for Pantani, it's just an escapade for him, riding as hard as he can. He doesn't even think about asking Garini for any help at all. And Pavel Tonkov riding sensibly. He's now picked up at Buena Hora, riding for him what is definitely a very long and lonely road. Well, if the situation was to stay like this, it would in fact be Tonkov who would take the pink jersey and uh, Pantani would move up into second place. Now, there's more time checks coming our way, 1.41 they're saying now, so they're losing a little bit of ground. As, uh, and there's the 3.50 mark, well that's it. That means Pantani is two seconds quicker now on the course, over the period of racing we've had, over Alex Zula. So he's out of the pink jersey, it's a question of whether it will go at the moment to Tonkov or to Pantani. And what's the bets for Pantani, the way he's riding? Unbelievable. You never, though, can discount Pavel Tonkov. He's such a good rider at dosing his effort. He won't panic at all. He'll ride a very sensible course for him. He'll make sure that he doesn't lose too much over the top of this very steep climb, the Paso de Sella. And he'll take a lot of risks on the descent. But the big advantage Marco Pantani has for a rider who is very light indeed, weighing around about 54 kilograms, is that he can go downhill very well. Well, Pantani getting a little bit of help now from Guirini. Because Guarini, I think, will begin to believe in himself here to survive with Marco Pantani over these two steep climbs. And Tonkov is not dropping any further back, Paul, and is looking quite good as well. One minute, 53 seconds. He started the day two minutes and two seconds behind Zula. But in fact, he was only one minute and 48 seconds ahead of Marco Pantani. So I would think Marco Pantani now is almost leader on the road. But you cannot discount Pavel Tonkov. He's still got an awful long way to go to the finish. And from the top of the final climb, you'd go downhill very quickly, 15 kilometers the descent off this mountain to the finish line. Guirini should pick up the advantage then if he hangs on to Pantani all the way over the ripples. And uh, that will certainly lift him uh, back up into the overall leaders as well. And he'd be pretty happy with that. He certainly will. And once again, as they go over the summit, he's waving the flag for Polti because last year he pit finished in this race in third in the overall standings after taking over the leadership from Luke LeBlanc. And he's proved to be a very solid rider indeed. And Pavel Tonkov now approaching the summit of the climb. We'll get a chance to see just what sort of damage has been done by Marco Pantani. Well, Pantani, his team as a team, and also right up on the top of the leaderboard in the team competition. So Pantani trying to bring them the pink jersey as well. As we flip over the top, 202 now. Uh, two, the main man in this group is number two behind uh, the leader there, and that is Tonkov. Now, what is Zula? And it's still counting when the clock stops, because it's certainly going to go. 348 is the magic time that will depose him of that yellow jersey, and we haven't quite got there yet as we join the front two on the descent. 
descent, and I think we'll see some good racing here. Here comes the Zula group, and oh goodness me, Paul, it's 4.35 and counting. Well, Alex Zula's lost an awful lot of time, but the man doing the great ride is Pavel Tonkov, the former winner. He's ridden sensibly, he's not lost too much time on Marco Pantani. He won't, for the moment, be in the pink jersey, but what is important now is just how much time Marco Pantani can conserve on this descent, and he's the one putting the pressure on, and he's taking a lot of risks going around these corners, but unlike the other day, these roads are very flat and the corners are very, very fast indeed. Absolutely. What we can see of the descent so far, this is the descender's delight here. Bit of a tight one there, though. <laughs> These are the kind of descents that Sean Yates used to adore. You can go down these mountains so fast, and a good descender can pull back one or two minutes on a descent like this. But you can see now, in fact, Garini is coming to the front and giving Pantani a certain amount of help here because he too feels that this ride by Pantani can move him up a little way in the overall standings. And in fact, the team manager of Mercatone Uno coming up alongside Marco Pantani here to give him some information as we approach the finish. But again, look at the speed here, 24 kilometers an hour. It's a tough day. Well, if the top stars can only do 24 kilometers an hour, goodness knows what the club cyclists would do over this course because this is a tough day today. And uh, nobody can ever say that Azula is a great descender. Look at him line up the back of the group here. He's going to pull back nothing on the way down to the finish at all. Pantani, it's all advantage him, and he's not descending that well either. Well, Tonkov pulling himself back into the race. One minute, 49 seconds behind. And the magic figure between Pantani and uh, Tonkov is one minute and 48 seconds. So Pantani's going to have to do something pretty special over the next few kilometers if he wants to pull the pink jersey as leader of the Giro d'Italia onto his shoulders. Well, Tonkov over the years has been a man of the Giro. He knows what it's like to wear the Magli Rosa. He knows what it's like, in fact, to win the event. And so he's not going to give up easy. Just one kilometre to go of what the riders claim is the toughest stage of this year's race. There will be a change in leadership. It's only a question of will it go from Zula to Tonkov or from Zula to Pantani? And Zula looking very difficult there. Garini's taking the advantage here over Pantani, who's trying to get onto his back wheel. So, Garini gets the, gets the result, and that's a great result. Pantani content with second. The clock starts now, and we wait to see whether the jersey goes to Pantani or Tonkov. But I think that Garini will be a top four contender after that ride today. And this uh, is the rest of the race coming in. Kepi Gonzalez, one by one, they're just going to drift in. 2.02 to Tonkov, so he will not get the pink jersey. It will go to Pantani, providing that Zula has not made some form of miraculous descent and has pinched back a little bit of time. There's Kamazin at 2.16 down. He'll get the fifth place finish, by the way. And thankfully, we haven't had to go quite that high in the race today, which is probably as well for everybody, except Pantani. Here comes Zula now. The clock says it all. He's out of the pink jersey. He's lost it again. He lost it to Gonchar, and then he lost it to Laurent Roux, and now he's going to lose it to Marco Pantani. The time gaps are big, but not too big with the time trial still to come. 4.36 the gap. And on the stage now, what a comeback after those horrible years of his major injury when he was thought he would never walk again, never mind ride a bike. Malco Pantani now leads the Giro d'Italia, a magnificent performance by Il Parato. He's won a stage in the race. He finished second a day. He probably let Guirini get that one. He was happy enough to live in the hope that he would pull on at the Maglia Rosa. Fantastic. For the first time in his career, he puts the Maglia Rosa onto his, onto his shoulders, and he certainly is going to appreciate that because there are still some very more difficult stages to come. And he doesn't have a major advantage over Pavel Tonkov. You can see, Phil, only 30 seconds and 31 seconds to Garini, who really made the operation of the day, and Alex Zuller dropping down into fourth place, one minute and one second behind, still not too far back. And the arrival of Oscar Kamazin now, he's up into fifth place. So, this tour is not finished yet. There's still a lot to come. And in fact, five more days, the penultimate day will be the final time trial. Alex Zula has not lost that much time. He must hang on today in the course, uh, taking the riders to an uphill finish. So it is a tough finish for the field. And uh, Paul, 162 at the start, only 97 left to face up to what is a short stage today to Pampiago. It certainly is, just 115 kilometres as Kepi Gonzalez has gone out very early on the attack to try and get himself some points in the King of the Mountains competition, which is currently still being led by Marco Pantani, but the jersey for the moment on the shoulders of Gonzalez. 
Well, only because uh, Pantani be too warm wearing two jerseys. He's got the pink jersey of race leader for the first time in his career. Makes him absolutely delighted. He's in his own terrain here. Everything going well for him today. He hasn't had any problems whatsoever. And as you can see, riding there in the immediate chase group. Very difficult stage today, though, Phil, because in the last 45 kilometres, there are three major climbs. The first one is the San Floriano, followed by the Passa de Lavazze, and then the finishing climb up to the Alpe de Pampiago is nine kilometres long, but at points, it's up to 20%. Well, the man blazing a trail here and looking set to, to pick up the lead in the King of the Mountains. If he keeps up, this is Kepi Gonzalez, who won this championship a year ago. But Pantani also scoring points and not too far behind him. Overall, Pantani had 55 points today at the start, which was 22 more than Gonzalez. Well, Gonzalez got to do something very special. But look at this. The man in the pink today oh. not giving very much away at all. Goes over the top of that climb, 36 seconds behind, but in second place to keep uh, maximum points in his back pocket and not let Kepi Gonzalez run away with this competition. So he's looking forward to the double here, but there's still the finishing climb, which also counts for the King of the Mountains. And it is a very hard climb indeed. One has to say it's very much the climb for Pantani, but first of all, they've got to get up with this rider who's just topped over the Lavazzi. And here he is at 20 kilometres to go and still away. Well, Kepi Gonzalez put an awful lot of effort into building up that lead, but it's only really hovered around the 45-second margin. And you can see in the group behind, all the major heads of state are there. Marco Pantani feeling very comfortable now in that pink jersey, which he's wearing for the first time on the roads of the Tour, a tour of Italy. Just 20 kilometres remaining, but look at what's in front of them. That very tough climb up to 1,750 metres. And still Gonzalez's lead hovering at 30 seconds. Which isn't very much at all, is it? And... Uh, they're not with the climb to come, although Gonzalez is a great climber, but he must be feeling a little bit tired now after his day out in the mountains. And every time he wins the points, uh, Pantani snatches second best, which is a bit disconcerting for him. He may not even know it, of course. Anyway, Pantani's got his boys back up to the front again to try and lift the pace. The pace being set uh, at the moment here by Podenzana, I think it is, and also behind him, Garzelli. It certainly is. Podenzana, one of the oldest riders in the Tour of Italy, at 36 years of age, a former champion of Italy, now really one of the great riders on the Mercatone Uno squad, working very hard indeed for Marco Pantani. Oops, a daisy. Looks like the legs decided to call it quits as the Mercatoni Uno boys go past Kepi Gonzalez and put him back in the bunch. You're never going to defend the 30 second lead as you're heading up to the final climb. Alex Zula looking reasonably comfortable today. He's got his teammates around him here looking after him. Armin Meyer is up in front. They're all riding on the back wheel of the Mercatoni Uno boys because, of course, when you have the leader on your team, then you're expected to do all of the pacemaking. Well, they're coming now towards the town of Tessero, and that indicates the bottom of the climb, and it's 8.9 kilometres to go to the finish from there. And I think uh, sporting a new haircut, Paolo Bertini there, has shaved his head to try and make it as light as possible because he's going to have some hard times over the next couple of days. Oh, and that reminds me, Paul. Mika Bartoli, by the way, was eliminated yesterday outside the time limit along with the sprinter Martinello and uh, quite a few other riders. And so Bartoli has gone, a leader of the tour in the opening week. Certainly have to call that rider enigmatic. One minute he's up and the next minute he's completely down. But when he's up, he certainly is one of the best riders in the world. Now an attack coming here from Kamenzin. So it's interesting to know that Kamenzin has gone clear with the rider who in the past really has been shackled a little bit by the fact that Michele Bartoli was his team leader, Paolo Bettini. So these two guys have a 15 second advantage over the main group now being led by the Festina squad. And Kamazin up to fifth overall in this race, but four minutes 13 off the jersey. He's actually developing into being a very good stage race rider, Oscar Kamazin. There he is, champion of Switzerland. Kamazin turned professional at a very late age, but certainly has slipped into the role of being a good climber quite quickly indeed, and a big ally to have for Pavel Tonkov. And again, the Mape boys are putting Kamazin up to the front of the race there to have somebody to leapfrog Tonkov off if Tonkov couldn't get away from the leader of the race. But it's going to be very difficult because Marco Pantani wants to do all of the work himself. Well, that's typical, and I say if he, if he starts to build up his rhythm again, then he's going to find very few left by the summit. At the moment, he's got Tonkov and Zula for company. His two arch rivals, I think, for final victory in the finish in Milan.
This is certainly a great kind of finish for Marco Pantani, a very steep climb. There are sections where it tips up to 20%, and one of the steepest parts of the climb is right up in the last kilometer. So that is certainly where Marco Pantani will try and put the hammer down. But Kepi Gonzalez, too, in the latter part of this Giro d'Italia, is riding himself into great climbing form. And Pavel Tonkov and Alex Zulla just have to sit there and keep an eye on the climbers and make sure they don't lose too much terrain. Fabian Yecker, teammate of Zulla, is just behind him to keep an eye on as best he can for as long as he can. Five kilometers to go. Kamazin looks as though he might be alone. Bettini may... Oh, no. He's got company. And the whole group has come up. So I'm just wondering if Bettini is still ahead. Bettini no, may, he's on the back. Bettini may well have been picked up by the rest of the group there because he's sitting right on the back there. Kamenzin put a great effort in to try and get clear, but now Kepi Gonzalez feels that he's got a chance of getting himself a stage victory. He's been pushing and looking over the last few days to try and do something special, but Pantani realizes this is the climb for him. It's a great kind of finale, the kind that he really does like. Well, seven riders clear here. The field once again is spread over many, many minutes as they make their way up towards the summit of the last climb of the day and the finishing line awaits them. Now everybody is waiting for the expected acceleration from Marco Pantani and is he building up for it right now? Certainly Tonkov is marking him, so too is Zulla, then comes Kamazin and that is the order as they go down. Ghirini is there as well. Well, this certainly couldn't suit him better because over the last five kilometers, this climb goes from 13% to 15% and to 20% in the last kilometer of the event. But Marco Pantani's putting an awful lot of effort into this, and he's trying now just to ride the other contenders off his wheel, and that's not the right way to go about winning a stage like this because all that Tonkov has to do is sit on the wheel of the Italian. Well, there's massive cheers again for Pantani. He's never afraid to work. He knows it is his tempo and his rhythm which breaks the riders. They're frightened now to go near this man when he's on his own playground. Uh, Tonkov is a very shrewd tactician. He's now sticking as close as he can, gearing. He's sensing the group is fading and crossing the gap. And once again, Alex Zula can't follow the acceleration of Marco Pantani, but neither too, I don't think, can Guerini. He's trying to get across there, but the man who's read the move and read the accelerations today is Pavel Tonkov, very comfortably sitting on the wheel of Marco Pantani. He realizes he started the day off 30 seconds behind Pantani in the overall standings, and he now must not let this little Italian take any more advantage, because with the time trial still to come, the advantage is certainly in Tonkov's court. And the name of Zaina on the, on the road there. Well, he's abandoned today. Uh, Velo, as far as I know, is still in. Uh, but this leading group is trying to make contact now with these two riders at the front. Tonkov will not assist Pantani, but he will try and jump in before the finish, I'm sure, if he can survive on the final slopes. What a great day for the first day in the pink jersey for Marco Pantani to be riding at the front of the Giro d'Italia. There, the man who started the uh, action very early on, Oscar Kamenzin, is accompanying Alex Zulla, who's slipping away from the leaders once again on the slopes of this Giro d'Italia. So Pavel Tonkov sitting there nicely. Finished second last year in the tour. The gap stretched now to the Zula Kamazin tandem to 31 seconds. And you know, Tonkov over the years has won 26 races. And you can add to that uh, the general classification of the Settimania Bergamasca this year, where he also won two stages. So after injury, Paul, this year, he's come back good. His form is arriving absolutely on schedule. And it looks like he's going to provide uh, Pantani because. In the time trial, in theory, the last time trial, it should go advantage towards Tonkov. Certainly, if Marco Pantani wants to win this Giro d'Italia, he's going to get himself a lot more time over Pavel Tonkov because he lost around about two minutes to him in the first time trial over 40 kilometers. And Tonkov, I think, has come to form just at the right time because the Settimana Bergamasca was just before this race just a couple of weeks ago. So Tonkov, for the first time, showing any signs of form as he built up for this event. And he's actually manoeuvred uh, Tonkov into the lead now as we continue on the steep climb. Not something Pantani does too much of. Now he's either using his head a little bit or he is feeling the pace and he's not climbing as well as he normally does. And uh, the crowd there still raising a little bit of encouragement for him, to say the least, and there's some pretty fit spectators down there. They certainly love Marco Pantani, but the day after he took the, uh, the pink jersey in this event, he will be a little bit tired because last night he will have had to go to the press room and he will, be, uh, will have stayed up very late indeed talking to journalists, explaining what it's like to have the pink jersey at the Tour of Italy. And that may well be why he's pushed himself back into second position here because Tonkov is a very strong rider here, finding his form in the last few days of the Giro 
Italia and not looking like a weak man here, a big powerful rider capable of pushing a massive gear on these climbs. Well, today doesn't see the end of the mountains and there's four days left in the Giro d'Italia. It has been an extraordinary race this year. If Pantani can survive uh, to win it, the crowd will go absolutely berserk in Milan. But you know, he's not climbing as well. And I think Paul's got the answer there. 600 meters to go to the finish now and Tonkov is looking good. Pantani's had a stage win. He finished second on the mountain stage to Ghirini. He might well have to allow Tonkov to take the line this time out, but at least he knows he's increasing his overall lead over everybody else he also has to be careful as well because there are bonus point bonus seconds still on the finish line here and Pantani seems to be suffering to stay on the back wheel of Tonkov because he keeps consistently getting out of the saddle trying to keep the pace up as they get closer to the finish it's Tonkov winding it up Ooh, and look at the face on Pantani he's determined to hang on to his wheel because the timekeepers will split time riders on the mountain top finish so he wants no gap between that wheel but I think there's going to be at least a one second gap as Tonkov comes away and gets his stage win so the winner of two years ago the second man last year gets the victory in Pavel Tonkov and uh, for the rest though they are losing time to Marco Pantani well, a great ride here, in fact, by Nicola Michelli, who's coming up to the finish because I've never seen him for the whole of this afternoon stage. And all of a sudden, he's popped away to get himself a very nice third place. Thank you very much. He's just over half a minute outside the two leaders. Well, he must have got round Alex Zula somewhere. Our camera didn't find him, but there is Zula coming home in fourth place, and he's going to be the best part of a minute conceded. And that's another minute with the time trial still to come. So Zula is losing his grip on this race, I think while Pantani keeps nibbling away. Zula is in, they say 56 seconds there. And this is Giuseppe Garini. He's gonna be outside at one minute, but should hang on to his top three placings. And so the first five riders are home. An extraordinary race again. There's the confirmation of the result. In fact, Zula 58 seconds, Garini at 107. Kamazin coming home in sixth place. Uh, Bettini, they're all uh, familiar names for us now. And the overall now, 27 seconds to Pavel Tonkov. That is not much. Ghirini at 1.47. Zula out to 2.08. So Zula is looking less likely to win this tour. But what about Pavel Tonkov? And so to the last day in the Dolomites. 19 stays from Cavalese to Plan di Monte Campione. And now... 239 kilometers. It's a long, long stage today. Zula chatting away with his Swiss countrymen there, Kamazin, still finding time to smile, but I think Paulie's lost this tour now. I think he realizes now that he won't be able to pull back that amount of time on a man like Marco Pantani in the mountains. And I don't think he'll be able to pull back that amount of time in the final time trial either because he really uh, has to do something very special to try and pull back two and a half minutes on a man like Marco Pantani. And there's still a very tough finish to go and he hasn't been able to match him on the mountain top finishes. And today the climb up to Plan di Monte Campione is a very difficult one indeed. Well, here's an early attacker here making his way in Nicholas Axelsson, who's a Swedish rider on the Skrinjo team. We've hardly seen a Skrinjo rider on the attack this year. Axelsson finished third overall in the Tour of Lankawi in the early of the earlier this year in February. A very good rider indeed. The Skrinjo team had an awful lot of success there, and they hoped that that would lay the foundations for what was going, was going to be a very good Tour of Italy for them, but it certainly hasn't been a great one. But Axelsson now trying to wave the flag for his team with a three-and-a-half-minute advantage over the chasing group, which it seems has been reduced quite rapidly. Let's see, three, six, nine, maybe ten or so riders here in this group. Pantol, maybe a few more now they've come into the picture. Pantani is down there. So too is Kamazin, the easy to spot. Also Zula, I think, was there. And Pavel Tonkov. But we'll wait for confirmation of that. Here is Pavel Tonkov. This is Yanni Bunyo here. Well, that's amazing. We haven't seen Bunyo for a few days either. Bunyo obviously riding himself into form in the latter part of this Giro d'Italia. A great competitor and a former fantastic champion. And it would be good to see him get a stage victory before the end of this Tour of Italy because he certainly, I feel, will be retiring at the end of this year. Yes, he certainly will. He's already announced this will be his last season. But there's the position over the top. Axelsson ahead of Kepi and Gonzalez and Piccoli up there. So Gonzalez still trying to nibble away at the King of the Mountains lead of Marco Pantani. But I think time also has run out for that. It's also running out as well for Luc Leblanc sitting at the back of the group here, just hoping to survive for the next few days. Not been a great tour of Italy for Luc Leblanc, but it certainly has for his teammates. 
Well, there's the holder of the pink jersey of the Inter Giro, Mariano Piccoli, who always seems to win something in the Giro d'Italia. He has been a couple of times the king of the mountains. And you remember that magic first week he had here when he wasn't too far away from picking up the Magalia Rosa. Anyway, Axelson, Axelson is still clear, but only by 78 seconds now. Well, he's trying to survive here, but it's an awful long ride along the valley road before they get to the bottom of the final climb of the day, the Plan de Monte Campione. It's going to be a very difficult climb as well, for, because I'm sure Marco Pantani realises now that he's got to try and open up a few more seconds over Pavel Tonkov and Alex Zula if he wants to win this year's Giro d'Italia. Well, Marco Velo making uh, light work of the chase here on behalf of his teammates. Now these riders are closer to the leader. They're 45 seconds down at the last check. And number eight down there is Salvadelli from the Seiko team, which is becoming a pretty much of a headless team these days. In fact, they've surrendered, and they're going back into the uh, Maglia Rosa group. And the reason for that, Phil, is because there's two teams working very hard together at the moment, Mercatoni Uno and the squad of Mopay, because Alex Zula is a long way behind, eight minutes and 20 seconds, so he must have blown up. I think he's hit the wall big time. He's completely been dropped. They've been reporting he's been dropped, and now we've got confirmation over eight minutes down. He's falling right away at the moment from a top six position overall. And Pantani won't be too concerned about that, and neither will Pavel Tonkov. The race now for sure is between these two riders, and Tonkov must hang on to Pantani. Then he's going to have a real shot at him in the time trial. And that really makes the race by Axelson here almost secondary because these two riders we're looking at in the white jersey of the Mape squad and the pink jersey of the leader of the Giro d'Italia is going to be a real duel between those two riders on the final climb of the day. Well, it's been a good ride by the Scrigno rider, and I think uh, the sort of indication there is he's been told to get out and do something and get themselves on television because we haven't seen too much of the team at all at the moment. This is uh, Gianni Bugno, and he's again trying to help his team leader. What a marvellous man he is. What a star. The American riders on the Motorola squad used to call him Johnny Bugno, <laughs> but he really is a great character and a tough rider and never, never worried at all about doing a lot of work at the front of the main field, and he's working alongside Mercatuna Uno, but these two guys locked in an incredible psychological battle. Marco Pantani and the man who wants to dethrone him, Pavel Tonkov. And Kamazin's still there and certain to climb up a little bit too. And Ghirini is also there trying to claim a podium place. So there's an in-battle going on there as well. Kamazin's the one slightly disadvantaged. The time gap's a bit bigger back to him. Podenzana on the front there, setting the tempo, keeping the pressure very much on in the Maglia Rosa group here. And you can see the riders at the back certainly are starting to suffer an awful lot there as we look now at Nicola Michelli, who's riding very well to stay in with this group. A great performer in this year's Giro d'Italia. But it's amazing how, how hard a domestique can work. And there's an attack by Pantani, and there's still an awful long way to go. Well, he accelerated back past his teammate Poddenzana. Tonkov spotted it straight away and has gone for him. Takes a lot of terrific guts to go for Pantani when he gets, gets that magic acceleration. But Pantani has gone, and Tonkov has joined him. So the tandem is in action again. Yesterday they held on to the finish and it was Tonkov who got the stage. But now Pantani knows as he says goodbye to his favourite terrain, he's got to get a gap between himself and between uh, Tonkov. Well, in the last five kilometres, this climb does get very steep. It goes up to 21.5% with around about four kilometres remaining. And the last one and a half kilometres are 23.5%. So if Pantani's going to do something special, he must do it on that section. There's Podenzana on the front. There's just a small gap, enough for Pantani to go through there. He goes into the corner and accelerates away. But just goes to show, Phil, how alert Tonkov is because he wasn't going to let that one go. No, he wasn't, and uh, he was straight out of the saddle as soon as it happened. Off goes the hat now, and it's down to business here. We are looking at what the whole of the Giro d'Italia has been about these last few days. One of these riders will win this race, that's for sure, and they're not going to reveal the secret as to whom until we get to the finish in Milan. Well, with 27 seconds advantage over Tonkov at the moment, that is certainly not enough for Marco Pantani to have confidence going into the final time trial because that is where Pavel Tonkov has the advantage over the slightly built climb of Pantani. But Pantani, as he goes under the banner, showing him 15 kilometers still remaining of this climb, is looking very confident indeed. And he never once asks for Tonkov to come to the front. In fact, he's trying to do that now, but Tonkov will not help. He just takes a look at him. He slowed the pace down. Tonkov not worried, he knows if he can hold this sort of time gap. 
on Pantani. The time trial could swing this race in his favor. Ghirini is now chasing on the slopes behind, so he could come up with a slowdown because it was only two days ago after his great ride over the Marmalade that Ghirini said he believed he could win this race. Um, and you know, well, why not? Here he is. He's only 40 seconds back. 40 seconds is a long way on a climb like this, and those two riders at the front are riding very well indeed. Tonkov won't let Pantani go into second position here at all because he realizes if he lets the Italian go behind him, he cannot respond to the incessant attacks and changes of rhythm that Marco Pantani is capable of. Well, the one man they've seriously damaged today, Alex Zula, is now more than 10 minutes back and losing endless time, apparently. He's really struggling to see the end of this stage. We've no cameras back there. You'll have to take my word on it. But Zulla is now going to be out of the top 12 overall if the time checks are real. And I think they are. I have to say, Phil, I think Zulla underestimated the Tour of Italy. He came here with his team and they were very dominant in the first few days of this Giro d'Italia and he's used too much of his effort. He's un un overspent on his forces and I think now in the last few days he's starting to pay for them. Well, Pantani has been so strong in the mountains, but he still hasn't got that final kick to his form that will distance Tonkov. And Tonkov, I think, knows this, and he seems to believe he's capable of hanging on to him. You see, Pantani wants help, and he doesn't normally ask for it. A bit of panic there. He really is worried about Tonkov because he realizes he couldn't get rid of Tonkov the previous day on a very tough climb like this, and he's tried to get him to come to the front now, forcing Tonkov now to set the pace. But if you look at the pedaling action of Tonkov there, it wasn't very tough. Pantani here looking across here, almost slowing to a stop, indicating to Tonkov, come on, play the, uh, play the fellow rider here and come to the front, and that is why we should work together, because we can get rid of all the other adversaries. A shake of the head by Tonkov. I've seen that a couple of times, and I think he's admitted he can't deliver the killer blow here today. He can't rid himself of Tonkov. And Tonkov is close and close indeed for the time trial. Ten kilometers from the summit, and still they are together. Back in the lead there was um, Marco um, Pantani as we go a bit further down. Still doing a great ride. One of the screen your rides is a different one now, Francesco Secchiari who is coming up in that chase group. I'm not too sure where he is on the course at the moment. And alongside him was uh, Clavero of the Vitalico Seguros team. And trying to get into the action, stuck in the middle in no man's land, is Garini. He's looking to try and see if he can see the back of the cars that are following the two leaders on the road, Tonkov and Pantani. And he's digging very deep indeed. He's third in the overall standings right now, one minute, 47 seconds behind Marco Pantani. But those two riders up the road are going to be very difficult indeed to pull back. Yeah, the gap is open and Secchiari and uh, Clavero, they'll be riding in fourth and fifth places on the road now. So Camazin is somewhere behind them, so he, might, he must be obviously losing time to these two leaders, although he is gaining it over uh, Alex Zulla, who's now reportedly more than 13 minutes behind. We're coming up to seven kilometers to go to the summit of the climb and they're now approaching the easier section of the climb where it levels out to around about five percent but very shortly it will kick up towards the finish line and we'll see percentages well in excess of 20 percent and that is where marco pantani is going to have to deliver the blow if he can to pavel tonkov well we've got a clock running here on the screen so the television director will hopefully stop it at the right place and we'll see what the gap is 9.2 percent is now the gradient here one in ten and pantani still can't find the little acceleration requires just a half a mile an hour quicker to rid himself of tonkov Girini continues to ride clear of the field in third place he really did show now or does show now rather that his place in the tour last year third was no fluke Certainly wasn't Daniel Clavero, Vitalico Siguros in second position here, but the big battle is further up the slopes as Pavel Tonkov feels very comfortable sitting in second position here behind the man who's leading the race, Marco Pantani. 1.22 now is the time gap to Garini, who's a lot further down the climb. Three kilometers to go to the summit for him and a very long and hard summit. And there's the first chink of... Uh, pain starting to appear in Tonkov, an acceleration coming from Pantani, but still he can't get rid of Tonkov, Phil. 
He can't. He keeps on trying. Tonkov, though, I think has cracked. He's got the signs of it. And this is a last gasp effort by Marco Pantani. You know, the second he gains, if he stays away to the finish, uh, could win in the tour here over Tonkov because he needs more time before that last time trial, and he knows it. And this is his final hope of getting any more time. It's the last big chance to try and increase the buffer between himself and Pavel Tonkov. Tonkov really has blown away there. It's only about 12 seconds at the moment as they go around that corner. But this is the attack. Once again, he attacked him two or three times, and each each time Tonkov was able to respond, able to come back up to the wheel, and then this time he just sat down and could not go anymore. Well, for the moment I thought it was not a problem, and then all of a sudden uh, Pavel Tonkov just hit the wall, sat up, and it was all over. And now Pantani, once he knows he's got him, he's going to go even faster. Now Tonkov is still a long way clear of Ghirini and Secchiari and Clavero. They are now minutes behind. Ghirini is over two minutes back of him, and Secchiari is a further minute on top of that. So they're not going to catch Tonkov, providing he just keeps his steady cool here. Well, after 19 stages, 240 kilometers this morning, and this final few meters of this climb are an average of almost one in four, 23 and a half percent. And Marco Pantani makes it look so easy. He just gets out of the saddle and keeps digging away, and he's looking for that banner there, showing him that there's just one kilometer left to go to the finish. And he will sprint with all of his might to try and get a few extra seconds over Tonkov. Absolutely, as he makes his way up towards the finishing line now, Pavel Tonkov. Just over a thousand meters to go towards the finish. He won't climb this in a minute and 12 seconds, though, even if he is Pantani. It'll take him a bit longer than that, but the more time he's out there, I think the more time he's gonna gain now. Well, it was 27 seconds, the advantage that Pantani had this morning and this afternoon is certainly going to be a few more than that. And Pantani now knows this climb. He's been out here training. He knows exactly what the final few corners are like, and they're very steep indeed as he picks his way around. And Tonkov looking further down the slopes, Phil, looks like a man who really is losing big time. 25 seconds, and the clock is still ticking. The clock is still ticking. That's the way it stopped at turn. Oh, it has. It's still going, in fact. And Pantani is pulling away at the kilometre to go. This is going to be close to a minute on the line with a 1,000 metres left to go up. Here's the one kilometre sign, and he goes through there about now, 42 seconds. Uh, so Paul is going to concede almost a minute after hanging on for so long today. Pantani is getting a big gain here. Well, that's the advantage of being a pure climber, to be able to explode like that in the last two or three kilometres of a mountain like this. And this is the steepest part of the climb. We're over 23%. And look at Pantani go. He's got the perfect gear. He's getting out of the saddle when he needs to. Sits down in the corners to go around there nice and smoothly. And once again, when it opens up, he's out of the saddle, accelerating, making the most of the gears as he can do now. And Further down the slopes, he's opening up major time on Pavel Tonkov. Well, this is a fine show of defiance now by Marco Pantani. He knew he had to win today to make sure that he took some big lead into the time trial tomorrow. And he's still dancing up this climb now. He's had a stage win already. He's, of course, got for the first time the Maglia Rosa. Now he's got a second stage win. Look at the time, almost eight hours in the saddle today. Now you'll see the damage done. And we've heard rumors that Zulla is more than half an hour behind today. He's lost so much time now. Here comes Pavel Tonkov up to the line, almost a minute, 55 seconds, they say, on the line. This will be Ghirini, who holds on to his top three places overall. The top three overall in the tour have just crossed the line now. The double-arm salute from Marco Pantani, who now makes himself look a little bit more realistic in that leader's jersey. Winning today by 57 seconds, Ghirini, Secchiaro, Clavero and Di Paolo in that order. The big loser, though, there's no doubt about that, it was Alex today his tour took a big big blow well we're getting down to the closing stages tomorrow it is the uh, the final time trial now it's stage number 20 and this really shouldn't be too much of a threat for the leaders of the tour from Barrio Terme to Mendrisio 137 or so kilometers and the overall lead for Pantani, a minute and 28 seconds. Ghirini at 5'11". Alex Zula is now 14th, and he is 32 minutes and 24 seconds down. And there's a little bit of a uh, few extra names for you to look at. Oscar Kamazin is fourth, and those four clear of the field, really. Michele has ridden a great tour to come into the fifth-place slot, and Bettini has always been an ever-present, but he's still a long way down, isn't he, at more than 19 minutes. So, Pantani 
money today is job simple to keep an eye on Tonkov and then see if 1 minute 28 seconds is enough for him to take this tour out in the time trial tomorrow. And a lot of people will tell you they don't think so. Well, it works out at around about three seconds a kilometre that Tonkov has to pull back on Marco Pantani. And in the previous time trial, over 40 kilometres, he pulled back almost two minutes on Pantani. So it's going to be a very closely matched event going down to the very last uh, penultimate time trial before we head down into Milano. And I would think that Marco Pantani is not feeling too confident with that advantage. A little bit further down the classification, the Podenzana, twice a champion of Italy, is 11th. The grand old man always riding so well. Let's join the action now as we're getting through the race stage here. And nine kilometres from the finish, in fact, we've got something like uh, 15 to 20 riders in this breakaway. That's uh, Di Pascali looking over his shoulder for Amore Vita. Luca Shinto, there he is. He was winner of the Tour of um, Langkawi uh, last year over in Malaysia and the rest of the group are pulling them all back. The main uh, body of the race with all the important riders is a little bit off the pace today and that's not surprising. Certainly isn't surprising after that very difficult stage yesterday and now taking up the lead for the ASIC squad is uh, Alexander Sheffer wearing number 24. He's managed to slip away from the rest of that group as well. Well Alexander Sheffer, a Kazakhstan rider been around a while now, one of the first, he might even be the first rider ever to turn professional for Kazakhstan. As he now tries to slip away here, he's had, he, had a, he was having a very good Tour de France last year. You may remember a rider disappearing under a hot dog stand in the time trial. Well, it was Alexander Sheffer. Back in the main field, the race really being controlled by the Mercatone Uno squad of, Mar of Marco Pantani. But they're not too worried, I don't think, by the composition of this leading group of riders as we head now down towards the finishing line in Mendricio. Around about eight kilometres left to go. And Alexander Sheffer has around about 100 metres over the rest of the group, which is at the moment being led by uh, one or two riders trying to make sure that he doesn't steal a march over them before the finish line. Well, some names for you in this breakaway. Paolo Lanfranchi, uh, Felici Puccini, Sheffer, you've seen. David Rebelin's an interesting man in this breakaway. Vladimir Belli is a good rider. And Gabriella Colombo is in here. T uh, so too is Mariano Piccoli. Well, why wouldn't he be? He always seems to be in the moves. He's been very consistent this year. So it's all back together again for Alexander Sheffer. And once again, the attack coming this time. It's one of the riders from the Pulte squad has decided to go out there and try and steal some advantage before we get down to the finish line. And amazingly enough, it's Luc Leblanc. And I'm surprised they let him get into a group like this. Well, I'm surprised because I didn't have his name in the list of front runners. But there he is, Luc Leblanc. He's no longer a contender for the overall. He's had his good days, but I'm afraid they've been outnumbered by the bad days as Luc Leblanc tries to get something out of his Giro d'Italia this year. Strangely enough, I caught sight of uh, Kepe Gonzalez in that group as well. So the team of Marco Pantani have let one or two dangerous riders get into this little group here because, in fact, Daniel Di Paoli, who is in that group, rode very well yesterday and moved himself up quite high in the overall rankings. Well, these riders having come up in that little change towards the end of uh, the last few kilometres we saw, this is the green jersey of Kepe Gonzalez, 16th overall, but he's over half an hour off the pace now. The gaps have opened, it's a two-man race for the finish in Milan. And the big prize money, almost uh, a million pounds or 1.4 million dollars US, the overall prize money of the Giro d'Italia this year. And 150,000 of those dollars will go to the overall winner. And will it be Marco Pantani or Pavel Tonkov? That's uh, a question we can only answer tomorrow night, I reckon, Phil, after yeah. that very difficult time trial on the way down to Lugano. But last year's King of the Mountains still trying to get a stage win out of this and on this little climb here, a lot of tired legs. Look at the spaces now between the wheels as the riders just grapple with whatever they can find in front of them. And that group is still quite large. It certainly is, and there's a lot of Mercatone Uno riders on the front of the main squad, though, trying to make sure that those riders in the leading group don't get too much of an advantage because they have to keep control over the race over the next couple of days, and it will be good for their morale as Roberto Conti goes to the front to keep the pressure on. But Kepi Gonzalez has read the race nicely here. There's a small climb, just around about six kilometres to go to the finish, which is where Gonzalez is just now, and he's trying to make sure that he can go over the top there with an advantage of 15 or 20 seconds, but it's still a long flat run to the finish just past that seven kilometer to go banner and Kepi is just about to top that little climb I think There's a sharp right turn coming up now and you know that uh, he's a popular rider here in Italy 
He never fails to have a go. He really became a superstar in this event last year. Very, very popular rider indeed in the Giro after last year's event. Everybody glad to see him back. But somebody's going to have a go after him now. And this looks to me as though it is Luc Leblanc again. Luc Leblanc certainly looking for a stage victory in this Tour of Italy. He noticed the move there by Kepi Gonzalez. He's a great climber himself when he's on form. And he, know, and he knows that if somebody gets away with 20 or 30 seconds over the top of this final climb, then that's it. It's all over by the shouting. But Michele Bartoli's old teammate here, Andrea Noe, the former wearer of the pink jerseys, decided, I too want to try and get another stage victory. Once you've had one, you want another. Absolutely. I've lost track of Noah for the moment in the overall classification. But that's David Rebelin, who's also up here in this front group. And also, right, he was a star of the Tour basically a couple of years ago when he held the lead. I think it was for 10 days. And uh, that's when people started to recognize his name. At last, he'd come good, former Olympic rider. Mariano Piccoli looking very comfortable trying to cover the moves there. But look at this. Luke Leblanc is having a very hard time getting onto the back wheel of uh, Kepi Gonzalez there. He's finally done it. But it just goes to show how well Kepi Gonzalez is going as he goes there past the banner, showing them just six kilometers or four miles left to go. Well, it's not so far, is it? But they're a full flight here now. Gonzalez has showed his resistance. And Luke has come up, but I caught a glimpse of his face. That hurt Luke LeBlanc to get across to Kepi. Now he's got across. He's not rushing straight by to carry on with the pacemaking. Instead, he's checking out the gains, and he's trying to find time for a little bit of a deep breathing exercises before he goes again. Now he's, uh, now he's going to try and hurt Kepi. Before he came to the front, though, he looked over his shoulder just to see how far behind the rest of the group was. And they're around about 12 seconds, and the big pressure on the front is coming from the Brescialat riders. And right behind the uh, rider there in the Ciclamina jersey is riding exceptionally well. That's Piccoli. He's looking to try and make sure that he takes that jersey all the way to Milano. So we've got a tandem here now, which is a Colombian... French tandem on the roads of Italy at five kilometers from the finish. They've got a real chance here. Let's have a little look back. Oh, well, they're going pretty quick and maybe they haven't got a real chance at all, but five kilometers is not that far from the line. Well, pickle has got his teammate on the front there. He's giving him the nod, saying, look, you know, I've been pretty close before. I've got this jersey on my shoulders. I need a couple more points, and I can take it all the way to Milan. Put the pressure on and make sure you pull these two guys back, because certainly they'll start to play around once they get towards the finish line, because Kepi Gonzalez is the kind of tactical rider who'll start to sit on the back wheel of Luke Leblanc once he can sense the chance of a victory. But Leblanc keeping the pressure on the front here, starting to panic. Once a rider starts to look over his shoulder like that, Phil, yeah. it means he's losing confidence. Well, he's lost a lot of time. His form hasn't really come through in this year's race. He had such bad luck in the Giro last year when he was definitely on a podium finish, but for that nasty crash. And uh, he was lucky to even continue in the race for a day or two. There's the main field, the uh, main chase group, the champion of Italy, uh, Gianni Farazin, riding for the Mappe team. He's still in the thick of the fray. Sitting on his wheel is Alexander Sheffield, who's tried an attack. He's got a teammate here in Andrea Noah. As we look down the line of riders looking for a likely candidate uh, to take this stage out if they can pull back the two leaders. Well, Alexander Sheff is the kind of guy who can jump away in the final few metres of a race like this, a very fast finisher. Buena Hora there, number 177. He's uh, quietly slipped into the, the nice breakaways over the last couple of days. Surprising to see him taking part on a, an aggressive flat stage because he's the kind of man we'd expect to see more of in the mountains. Four kilometres remaining for the two leaders and still their lead is very precarious indeed. Two on the roundabout there. That's the right side if you live in Europe. It'd be the wrong side if you lived in Great Britain. As the riders now make the way towards the finish, you can forget any chance of the main chase coming in today because they are a long way behind and have no interest in this breakaway today. It'll pan down just to see if one or two riders in the chase group have now got these two in their sights. But you know, Paul, with such a, a short distance to go, this is still looking good. It's still looking very good indeed. But you notice now that Kepi Gonzalez has gone to the back for the last kilometer or so. He's forcing Luke Leblanc to do a lot of the work. And Leblanc is a very intelligent rider. He's been a pro for many years now. And he won't like the fact that Kepi Gonzalez has stopped contributing to the success of this breakaway. And shortly, I think these two guys are going to slow down a little bit as Gonzalez has, has realized that uh, Luke Leblanc is not going to carry him to the finish and he has come over the top of the Frenchman to keep the pace high but look at this the gap is still hovering at 10 seconds there's 16 riders in that chase down there and there's about half of them committed to catch the two leaders and it's going to be a tough chase but they might just about get them you know the chases have a nasty habit of timing everything to perfection 
How about the last 500 metres at the moment? Because it's looking that way, isn't it? It certainly is. Gonzalez didn't look very comfortable on the back wheel of Luke LeBlanc there. As they go around that corner, it's come down to around about five seconds, and it looks as if the Bresselat rider on the front is certainly trying to set it up for Piccoli, who's currently sitting in second position. And the guy who's leading them out will push himself right into the depths of the red zone because he realises that Piccoli has got a great chance of a victory here because he knows now that he's in the ideal position as we get closer and closer to the finish. LeBlanc has switched over to the left-hand side, and once again, a panic move by Kepi Gonzalez and LeBlanc realizing that it's almost all over by the shouting because these two guys certainly haven't got the impetus left to hold off this group. Well, he's raised his game again, and Luke LeBlanc, when he saw Kepi spin through, he thought about it, but he went back to his back wheel. But it's not going to worry too much about it now because it looks like the rider just behind him there is Mariano Piccoli, who's brought the whole lot back into the action. Uh, Piccoli's the rider in that nice mauve jersey. He's used his teammate to do the damage, uh, Zgambaluri, who was second in the under-23 championships a couple of years ago. Also moving up there, the Seiko Cannondale rider, Paolo Salvadelli as well. And in the main field, it's the yellow squad on the front, the squad of uh, Marco Pantani, the leader of the race. And they're obviously not too worried about the situation up the road. All they want to do is to make sure they get Marco to the finish without any problems. So Piccolo is just riding in second place. He's obviously told his young teammate to just keep the pace high now. He's really fancying a stage when he's been so close so often and it hasn't come his way yet and since, not since first stage of course when he nipped away and beat all the sprinters but since then he hasn't had the chance to win a game and he hasn't been quite the climber he has been in the past in this race either and uh, well times change of course and now he's in a breakaway once more and he should be in with a good chance here. Salvadelli moving up into first place now, keeping the pace high. He's used to working like this because normally he would do it for Mario Cipollini. Moving up into fourth place there is David Rebellin and Gian Matteo Fanini in the blue jersey there, moving up into fifth place. And everybody now getting into the position for what is going to be a group sprint towards the finish line. And the group of Pantani is a fair way behind there. There's a little bit of leaning on the shoulders by uh, <laughs> Gian Matteo Fanini there. He realizes he wants to keep the wheel of Piccoli. He reckons he's the fastest guy in the group. So Fanini is the leader, the Blue Jersey is the leader of the Inter-Giro competition and that's what it means and he's now got the leader of the uh, points competition right in front of him, Piccoli and there's going to be some valuable points scored today by the consistent finishers too because they're both in this front group. Salvadelli now up into second position, still Piccoli in third place there, happily sitting on the wheel of Salvadelli, the big lead-out man for Mario Cipollini normally, and Fanini moving up into third spot now. A little dodgy corner there just before the finish line, and if you're not up there to the front now, then you're much too far behind. Well, there's 18 men in the hat here now as we approach the finishing line, and again, the pace still being set here by Salvadelli, kept up nice and high. And look at the face of Fanini there, who's in third wheel. He knows that if he's going to win this, he's going to take on Piccoli. Uh, Piccoli just waiting and waiting and waiting because he's got a good finish. He's not a pure sprinter. Fanini, oh, the, somebody's come down the outside here with a terrific rush just off our camera. And it's a Festina rider who's gone for it this time through. And it's going to be very, very tight, but that's belly, and it's all over because Fanini got through, and he came off the wheel of Piccoli. And I'll tell you what, Fanini was the guy who was disqualified from the tour last year. After he was leading out Cipollini, he sat up and he blocked the rest of the race and he was thrown out of the Giro. Now uh, his teammate Cipollini no longer in the race and Fanini no longer on the team either. And he's now taking a stage win for himself. Well, it's been a long day in the saddle for Mar Marco Pantani's Mercatone Uno boys, and they've really ridden like Trojans right at the front for the last 20 or 30 kilometres, setting the pace. All they have to do is just make sure that they can get Pantani to the finish, because for him tomorrow, it's all on his own. It's the individual time trial when he has to match himself against Pavel Tonkov. So the former lead-out man, or the lead-out man for Cipollini, who's now out of the tour, comes and takes over the role himself and gets uh, an opportunist stage win there in the Giro d'Italia. So he's keeping Seiko's name on the headlines here in tomorrow morning's papers. And he watched the right man too, Mario Piccoli, because Piccoli got second. The man that came with the rush, Vladimir Belli, hung on just off the edge of our cameras, I think, for third place. And Colombo got home in fourth, and David Rebelin, he was there in fifth place. That was the unofficial list over the line. But I have to say now, he gets rushed into the hut and gets ready for the presentation while a long thin line of riders are still some way out of town.
certainly been a tough day for these guys and it's a long line the main field and you can see the speed is quite remarkable but this is just how to time a sprint to perfection just coming through there Fonini gets it a full bike length ahead of Piccoli who was certainly the man to watch as you said and that I think is how Mate Gian Matteo Fonini based his sprint he wants to get onto the wheel of Piccoli and when it came to the line he just opened up the gas and he certainly had the power to do it because up through the middle Belly caught tried to surprise them but he didn't have enough power just to keep it going so Piccoli, second place for him. He's been so consistent, keeps his lead in that uh, nice uh, what purple coloured jersey, I suppose you call it, or Cyclamen. And here comes the blue jersey of the Intergiro leader. And Gian Matteo Fagnini gets the stage victory, free as a bird without his team captain Mario Cipollini to interrupt. Cipollini would like that finish. So the teammates of Marco Pantoni fairly routine day for them today they've done their job well to try and get their man to the finishing line as fresh as possible tomorrow it is big showdown time in the penultimate time trial over 34 kilometers it's not that long 34 kilometers and you know Marco now is going to feel that he won't lose all of the time that he's made over Pavel Tonkov but he does need a fairly easy ride there's the stage winner for Seiko Jean Matteo Fagnini, he gets the victory, he gets the champagne. And they're all pretty good at opening the bottles when it comes round to the winner's podium, aren't they? Oh, he's not going to give too much away, he's going to drink it all himself. Well done. <laughs> so Mario Cipollini probably watched that on his television back home in Italy, and it's been a long escape, they're minutes ahead. And back to meanwhile, back out on the road, the Mercatoni Uno boys are bringing Marco Pantani in. There's the sprint finish yet again for you on this big time gap. And that's how uh, Fagnini saw the finish, took his chance and got the victory. Confirmation of the result, Piccoli, Belli, Colombo, all of these riders in the breakaway. There were 18 in the end in the breakaway. And uh, De Paolo getting the 10th place all same time after only three and a half hours racing today. So after over 3,600 kilometers, two men still in with a chance of winning the Giro d'Italia, and this is the penultimate ride of the start, Pavel Tonkov. The winner two years ago, and he knows, even though he's very popular here in Italy, that all of the cheers will be reserved for the man who will start behind him. The course is over 34 kilometers between Mendrisio and Lugano. I tell you, Phil, last night everybody was trying to work out the amount of time that Pavel Tonkov needed to take out for every kilometre. And looking back at all the previous time trials when they've come up against each other, all he really needs to do is pull back three seconds per kilometre on Marco Pantani, and that will give him the overall lead on the penultimate day this year of the Giro d'Italia. But he knows he has to go out and do that. And at the end of a, a race like the Tour of Italy, it's very difficult to come out and put in a special performance like this. But the course certainly does suit him. It's not not very tough either it's fairly flat with just a small climb towards the finish which I'm not so sure will favor Pantani but remember his gap is 1 minute 20 20 and there it is for you 128 uh, over or under Pantani's time for the course so far Ghirini third overall is over five minutes back and really doesn't matter now he should easily confirm his third place on the podium for the second year this man though was second last year he won the year before his record is tremendous in the years gone by he knows he can still steal this race on the very very last time trial and he's already off to a very good start. The position is perfect. He's right down on the center of those handlebars. He's opted for a full disc wheel at the rear of his machine and a tri-spoke on the front. An aerodynamic position for him and an aerodynamic machine. The man who really has to do something special, though, is the man here wearing the pink jersey, Marco Pantani. And he, too, is riding a fairly standard machine with a full disc at the rear. Caught by Alex Zuller in the time trial almost three weeks ago. Well, certainly two weeks ago now. And... Uh, Dropping away from the leaderboard, he bounced back in the mountains. In fact, he destroyed everybody except Pavel Tonkov in the mountains. Alex Zula, well, he's already riding at the moment, not recording great times at the checks. He blew up towards the end of this race. Now, Pantani knows this is the only man that will spoil what for him will certainly be the finest day of his sporting career. 
It's going to be a very nervous moment for Pantani as the seconds tick away for the very last time trial in this year's Tour of Italy. And he knows what times are going to be done out on the course by Pavel Tonkov. He will get that relayed back to him by his supporters at the side of the road, all cycling aficionados, and they will let him know exactly what's going on. Just looking at Tonkov's bike there, Phil, it looks very much to me as if he's opted for a 28-inch rear wheel there, which will give him a very large gear combination. Well, it's all or nothing, I suppose. His second place overall is assured. He's not going to lose time, I wouldn't think, to Giuseppe Guarini, but it's the first place he wants. Listen to the crowd, yes, Phil. It's oh, almost fantastic. like a football match out there. They're all shouting for Pantani, the man they call Elefantino. They call him the pirate. There are so many nicknames this man conjures up, and it's the last four seconds. And he goes to an enormous cheer here now. 34 kilometers, all that separates him from that Mayo Rosa, because tomorrow on the ride into Milan, nobody will attack him. He's going to be like a man possessed. Look at the way he's looking at the road. He is going to rise to the occasion. You get that feeling. Well, it's obviously what his plan is to go out as quickly as possible and try and match over the first four or five kilometers. The time's being done out on the course by Pavel Tonkov. This man looks like a machine this afternoon. He's perfectly still on his body. and his, bi his bike is ticking over nicely. Pantani, on the other hand, does not look like a time trialist at all, but he's gone out quickly. Well, look at this then. So Massimo Podenzana is setting the time for the rest to beat now because he's just going to get inside Velo's time as he comes up to the line for only just 40.23. Well, this is Marco Pantoni, and there are the times at the moment. Velo second, Serpolini's in, in third place, 31 seconds back. Alex will have finished, but he's already off the leaderboard and clearly no longer interested in the Giro d'Italia. But this man is, of course, head-to-head -head now uh, with uh, Pavel Tonkov. And the surprising thing is that, in fact, uh, Tonkov is down at the moment, Paul, by a few seconds to Pantani. Well, that's amazing. Obviously, what Pantani wanted to do was go out over the first 10 kilometres as quickly quickly as possible and see if he can just hold the tempo that he's chosen. He's doing that very well at the moment, but there's still another 20 or so kilometers to go. And Tonkov, to me, looks perfect. He's pedaling like a metronome, 52.1 kilometers an hour. Everything seems to be perfect. But in fact, Pantani, who doesn't look so good, is up on him on time. But only by two seconds at the moment, so you could put a handkerchief across them on the road. Well, now the arrival of Sergei Gonchar, winner of the time trial stage last year. And now he's looking a little bit labor, but his time is going to give him the rewards, I think. He's going to go onto the leaderboard. The time to beat Sorry, is that Paul, yeah. of Massimo Porenzana. Second is Marco Velo at the moment, and he is using a huge gear. The man who was very close to winning the time trial championships of the world last year in San Sebastian, looking for a stage victory here at the Tour of Italy. So it's a long way up to the finishing line here. Gonchar, though, is labouring his way up and is hoping that he will take out another time trial stage in the Giro d'Italia. Poddenzana is the man he's got to beat. He's in and he's got the best time. And Marco Velo is in second place at the moment. And Gonchar is making a meal of this, but it's a long, long, hard finishing straight. It's going to be all worthwhile. He's going to get inside Massimo's time. There's the line. And there's the time. 39.54, best time so far. Pantani is on a flyer here. And 1 minute 40, 1 minute 38. He's hovering 6 to 8 seconds the advantage. Well, there's the advantage that Marco Pantani has over Pavel Tonkov. So everybody's calculations from last night have Tore gone right on. out of the window. <laughs> it really has thrown a spanner in the works for the specialist. Because Pantani is ahead of Pavel Tonkov on the road at the moment in the time trial. And he's going to be very happy with that performance. Well, now let's see what Pavel Tonkov is doing here at the intermediate check. There's the best time, or well, second best time of Poddenzana. So, Paul, he's falling behind the time of Gonchar. Falling behind Gonchar, and it looks as if he's going to fall behind the time of uh, Mark Ponzana, but it's uh, around about the same time, 13 seconds faster. In fact, he's gone through in second place. Now, the next man to come up to this point is going to be Marco Pantani, and that will give us a good estimation of how the little Italian is riding. That same time check across that lovely little fucking swimming pool down there. Sergei Gonchar, still the best time. We've seen Tonkov go through with the second best time. Pantani is now, what's he going to do? Because he's still ahead of Tonkov's time as we approach that time check. Uh, this could be a turn up for the Bucks here. 2001, Tonkov went through. Whichever way you look at it, Pantani's on a great ride. He's the second best time, and there's no one else left to pass that point. 
Well, 11 seconds is advantage over Pavel Tonkov at this stage of the game, and that is a remarkable performance. We're halfway through this time trial, and I would think uh, Marco Pantani will be getting some very good information from his team manager, who's probably watching this live on TV. Well, here he is, and he must be surprised if he knows, and I expect he does, Paul, but in fact, uh, Pantani is inspired. Now we've got the double shot here. Marco Pantani's on the left, as if you need me to tell you. Well, it's incredible to look at the difference in the style of these two riders. Pantani on the left, a very punchy style, not really a pure time trialist. On the right, Pavel Tonkov looks very good indeed, still in exactly the same position he had in the early part of this time trial. Looking comfortable, still keeping the big gear rolling over, while on the other side, Pa uh, Marco Pantani is pedaling about 105 RPM. And almost 51 kilometers an hour in excess of 32 miles an hour. So don't anybody ever again say that Marco Pantani can't ride a time trial. I think he's doing the performance of his life here. He is not going to relinquish the pink jersey as leader. In fact, he's going to win this race in style, or at least beat Pavel Tonkov, even if he doesn't get the better of Sergei Goncha. Well, the clock there showing what the current overall standings are at the moment. The difference between these two riders is still hovering at 1 minute and 28 seconds. And in fact, that's exactly the time that it was this morning. So Pantani is losing a little bit of time over the in middle section of this time trial here. Tonkov is coming back, an excellent time trialist. He's judging his ride properly, but for the moment, he's not eating into the advantage of Marco Pantani. And that's what's important. The big effort here being made by Guerini. There's Alex Zula, seventh best time, still in at the finish for him. And Guerini's going to fall behind Zula's time, which I'm sure Alex will be disappointed with, but he never really tried today. He lost his chance of winning this race in the mountains. Guerini heads for the finish. Uh, Tonkov, still, it's a balancing act, Paul. They're locked together, both uh, Tonkov and Pantani, almost the same time overall as when they set out. It's amazing. It went to 11 seconds advantage to Marco Pantani. Now it's a balanced ride, but for Giuseppe Guerini, he's done the ride that he needed to do to make sure that he will climb onto the podium when we go into Milano tomorrow because his ride today will give him third place overall in the Giro d'Italia this year. Yeah, in fairness, there really was no big pressure on Guerini. Just a solid ride from him today is all that was required. Uh, Kamazin was too long, uh, too far behind him, and Giuseppe comes in 14th place at the moment. Enormous crowds here now as they strain forward to see coming up towards the finish Pavel Tonkov They will know from the Czechs on the road. This has been a tremendous battle between the Russian and the Italian Almost identical times out on the road Gonchar is still best man in at the finish Podenzana is the second place rider and Marco Velo is the third at the moment in the finish now Tonkov I think should get in amongst those surely well, once Tonkov comes across the line, these riders separated by two minutes on the road. The crowd won't have to wait very long till they know who is going to be the winner of the Giro d'Italia this year. But the style of Tonkov certainly hasn't changed at all, Phil, over the last few kilometres. And he's not going to win, Paul, because he's heading for the time of Marco Velo in fourth place. Now it's Serpolini. Tonkov comes in only fourth. 40 minutes and 29 seconds. That's not a good ride for the Russian. Well, that means now that Marco Pantani, who's coming in towards the finish, can afford to cruise home in a time of 42 minutes and 7 seconds. And I don't think that's going to happen, Paul. There's no way now that Pantani's going to win the stage. He's been down on Gonchar, but he's going to get some terrific satisfaction. I think he's going to beat Tonkov. Well, at the moment, the board there indicating that he's still got an advantage over Tonkov in this time trial here. Now hovering at three seconds, but a great ride by Marco Pantani with the pink jersey on his shoulders. That's the win at the moment. Gonchar is still leading ahead of Podenzana. And in fact, uh, Marco Velo still holding on to third place in the overall standings. But the man really putting in the performance and matching Pavel Tonkov, the Russian, all the way to the line is Marco Pantani. Just a few seconds separating the top four, but Tonkov, surprisingly enough, is fourth of those top four as Pantani continues to run him close, and we think he's still nibbling away one or two seconds quicker than Tonkov. It's going to be desperately close. If this had been on a track, this would have been one of the finest pursuit races you will ever have seen. It has gone up and down in favour of the other all of the time. But I think what has made the big difference, Paul, is the fact that Pantani is... 
proving to be unstoppable today, taking into account his history of injury, the fact he's Italian, the fact that he's going to win this race. And the fact, I think, that Bianchi have invested an awful lot of money into providing a very good time trial machine for him. He's done a lot of studies on his position recently in the wind tunnel to try and make sure he's as aerodynamic as possible. And that machine, as he goes under the one kilometer banner of this time trial here, is perfectly matched to Marco Pantani. And he's matched, he's matched Tonkov all the way to the line. Well, you can see in the team car behind, they're all smiles. They know that they're looking at the winner of the Giro d'Italia barring accidents tomorrow. Marco Pantani has pulled out of the bag the ride of his life against the watch. It's the moment of truth, yes, but it's also the moment of greatness of this man as he comes up towards the finishing line now. It's a considerable scalp to beat Tonkov if that's what he does or even get this close to him in a time trial because Tonkov is recognized as a great time trial rider. But Pantani now heading up towards the line. The Italian flags can wave for sure now because they are going to see an Italian winner tomorrow in Milan of the Giro d'Italia. The flotilla of motorbikes, the grimace on Pantani, he just wants to get it over with, but that grimace will turn to a smile in a minute. We are waiting now to see the clock come on our screen and tell us just how close to reality Pantani is. Well, he really has blown all the experts out of the water today, Phil. Everyone was saying he was going to lose at least two seconds a kilometre, and look at that time. He's going very close to his teammates there. In fact, third place time for Marco Pantani, two places ahead of Pavel Tonkov, and the time doesn't really matter. Even the police are applauding here because he has done what nobody thought was possible. For 24 hours, the so-called experts have worked out how much he would lose to Tonkov in the time trial. I bet nobody worked out how much he would gain, and that's exactly what he's done. And so the press are going to be delighted uh, with the next half hour or so of interviews that Pantani will give. The little man with the bald head, the pirate, has delivered the goods today. He's in amongst them. He has finished right up in the time trial. It was Gonchar for the record, Poddenzana, Pantani third, Marco Velo, his teammate, fourth. Marvellous day out for the boys from Mercatoni Uno. They'll win the team in this race as well. And Pavel Tonkov taking fifth with Serpolini six, Kamas in seventh, and Zula finishing only in ninth. Not the place for the world champion, but his incentive in this year's Giro has gone. And let's have a look at the overall. This will be pretty close to the final figures tomorrow now. Pantani has a 1 minute 33 seconds advantage. He's increased it over Pavel Tonkov. Garini third for the second year in succession, but 6.51. Kamazin right in the slot at four, but 12 minutes plus down. Clavero coming in at fifth, and the champion of Italy there in sixth. And Gonchar now in the top ten with his time trial performance today. And this is no way for Marco Pantani to win the Tour of Italy, is it? The rain is coming down here as the ride is now heading into Milan after 173 kilometers and the final stage, stage 22. Paul, the judges have taken the decision to time the race only to the entrance to the circuit. Well, that's because of the difficulty of actually racing around this circuit in these weather conditions. And I do believe the distance of this lap doesn't conform to the international racing governing bodies distances for the end of a stage race. But look at that as uh, oh. Rubiera goes through the puddles there. He really sprays up a lot of water and a lot of riders taking risks to try and win the stage. But for Marco Pantani, the first time they went across the finishing line meant for him that the clock had stopped in this year's Giro d'Italia. So now he's just riding round for the pleasure and savoring the moments that he can show off that pink jersey to the crowd here in Milan. Well, at the start of the week, let's not forget that Pantani crashed in weather conditions like this in the mountains. Since then, of course, he's built his lead. He's produced that extraordinary time trial to increase his lead. Now he just wants to keep out of trouble and get this race over and done with and be the first Italian uh, since Ivan Gotti, which is only a year, to win the Giro d'Italia. Jose Luis Rubiera from the Kelme squad of Spain trying to get out there and steal a march over the rest of the main field. And certainly still one or two of the sprinters left him with a chance of taking victory on the final stage here around the streets of Milan. But no more Mario Cipollini, the man who last year took out the points classification and was presented on the fin finishing podium in that magnificent white suit for which, again, he got a magnificent fine for from the international governing body. It's a pity that Mario is not here at the moment and I'm sure he's uh, back at home taking a keen interest in this on the TV, but for the moment, Rubiera is out on the front trying to steal the show away from the sprinters. 
Well, you see, just look at those road conditions now. They are not for the nervous at all. Those tram lines across the middle of the cobbles are absolutely deadly. You've got to meet them at right angles, otherwise you're down. And the rider's thinking more of self-preservation, I think, but you'll always get the kamikaze ones who'll want to go away and try and do something and try and get a stage win, especially in Milano, which is where all the Italians want to win. Well, Rubiera's uh, vantage there, seven seconds over the man who was chasing, who was Marco Di Renzo from the Brescialat squad. It's a very ten tender, tenuous lead that he's got here, just hovering there as we go under the one-kilometre banner, which shows just one kilometre remaining and the uh, end of this very difficult stage. Well, the riders remaining here in the race are just over 90, 94 to be exact. They're all not very far behind Ribeiro at all. And I bet they're delighted too. The 13 scheduled laps here reduced to only 10 and the time already taken as we race into the last few hundred metres. And Paul, it looks as though Ribeiro is going to be caught almost in sight of the line. Nasty left-hander there. It certainly is, followed by a nasty left-hander as well. And then he'll be into the finishing straight. But you can see the main field hot on his heels there. And a lot of riders trying to pull him back. There was the pink jersey of Marco Pantani safely in the first 15 positions there. But Ribeiro is still hanging on to about 10 lengths advantage over the Main field, but the sprint starting in earnest behind him. Well, they'll have to start in earnest because he's almost to the line here, but he's, uh, Piccoli is trying to get on terms. I saw Stratza was still there, and Fagnini is also trying to get up on terms. He's not going to have the legs. Poor Ribeiro, you've got to feel sorry for him here as he goes for the line. And bursting through on the inside, and that blue jersey again is Fagnino. Is he going to get it? Win number two for the Seiko man. That would be the stage that Cipollini would always love to win. And it's gone to his teammate, Gian Matteo Fagnini. He wins ahead of Massimo Stratza. But are in the middle of the pack there and happy to be at the finishing line, the pink jersey, and that's who the crowd have reserved their cheers for, of Marco Pantani, the big man, or the little man rather, has made a big return to the top cycle race in Italy, and he's won it so well with a brilliant time trial that left nobody in any doubt. The best man has won this year's tour, a tour which saw so many leaders when Zulla kept taking the lead back and in the end blew big time in the mountains and finally uh, didn't get anywhere near the winner's rostrum so marco pantani 101 will be converted next year to number one as a winner of the giro d'italia and this don't forget uh, was a great race this year paul the greatest performance was by marco pantani because a few years ago people thought he would never even walk again let alone ride a bike <laughs>